the buildings and online. Uh, and there's nobody in the public gallery at present, but advise those in the public gallery they're welcome to use mobile devices as long as they're in airplane mode and all devices are muted. muted. You can connect to the assembly Wi-Fi. Password details are available on the gallery rules. It's not permitted to take photographs or record any of the meeting. So that takes us to item one on the agenda, uh, and that is apologies. And I have apologies in from Cara Hunter and Danny Baker. I think that's everybody else uh, present apart from that. So moving on to item two in the agenda, chairperson's uh, business shouldn't take up <coughs> too much time. Uh, the first uh, item on that is just to draw members to uh, attention to a record of the informal meeting we held with Unite the Union uh, Registered Childminders branch on the 19th of March. That's at page five. Uh, I would propose that we uh, forward uh, the briefing papers provided by Unite um, to both the Department of Education and Department of Health, as I think that the, the issues they really wanted to raise were in relation uh, to the minimum standards and those ratios, uh, and I think it would be good to get uh, the, the Health Department's feedback on that. Uh, our members agreed that we, we seek both those <coughs> uh, views uh, on, on, on that, uh, those briefing papers. Our members agreed? Uh, item 2.2 uh, was the informal meeting held with the JNCTUS Joint Secretaries uh, in Education, and that was held yesterday on the 9th of <coughs> April. That's at page three of table papers. Uh, and, I, and I would just highlight there was there was quite a lot of material covered in that briefing that I think is relevant uh, to the evidence session with the EA today in relation to workforce, non-teaching workforce, and particularly particularly in, in the SEN uh, space as well. So, would just be useful to have made sure you familiar with familiarised yourself with that uh, with that briefing. Uh, and I think it would be worth drawing out. We did discuss the pay and grading review in some detail uh, in in the session yesterday, and it's welcome that that. Has as uh, we, we've had uh, noticed that that has been approved at Department of Finance, and we now obviously need to, 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 to uh, keep a close eye on that process as it progresses, uh, certainly with budget setting as well. Um, the only other item I just want to add at, at this item of the agenda is I'm conscious that quite a while back we did agree that we would take a bit of a closer look at RSE in the committee, and we haven't really picked that up in our work as yet. Uh, but I think just to draw members' attention to the fact that that is now uh, noted in the forward work plan and um, that has been uh, uh, added to table papers, uh, and I'm hoping with the agenda today we'll have a bit more of an opportunity uh, to speak to that in more detail. Um, I would like to begin some consideration around what the terms of reference of that uh, mini inquiry might be, uh, and maybe some timelines around how we, we start progressing that, but uh, we can come to that later in the agenda. So moving on to item three, uh, and that is matters arising, of which there are none, um, so we just move on to item four, draft minutes. Uh, refer members to the draft <coughs> minutes of the committee meeting of the 20th of March. Um, that's at page 10 of your meeting packs, and I would just be seeking members' agreement that the minutes uh, are a complete and accurate record of, proce of proceedings. Uh, is this agreed? Agreed. agreed. I got a copy to sign <coughs> That's great. So that moves us on uh, to item five on the agenda, and it's our first uh, oral briefing of the committee session today, and that is with uh, the Department of Education, uh, and that is specifically for a SEN uh, policy update. Uh, I would refer uh, members to the briefing paper from the committee clerk at page 18, and then at page six of your table papers, there is a briefing paper uh, provided by the department as well. So if we're ready, we can uh, bring uh, the witnesses through. Uh, right, okay. So they're, they're not in attendance at, at the moment. Okay. Uh, and I am assuming that no, no one from the EA were a bit too early for that as well. So no, that's fine. On that basis, I, I would propose we move on to item seven, which is correspondence, and we'll, we'll get that cleared at this stage. So if members are happy just to jump to that item uh, on the agenda. I would refer you to it's item seven and it's, uh, pages forty-eight to one hundred and forty-three, uh, where we have uh, twenty-one items under correspondence. And I also would refer members to the table papers where, where further items uh, were <coughs> were tabled for your reference. Um, so. I want to just, as, as sort of we've been doing in previous weeks, go through any items where I think there's likely to be a committee decision or a, a steer required, uh, where, and members can raise any others that I haven't identified, and the remainder will then be for noting. 
So item 7.3, that's a response from the Minister of Education uh, providing an update on the development and implementation of guidance on the use uh, of restraint and seclusion in educational settings. Uh, I, I would like to, to, to propose that we, we consider that on our forward work plan. I think it's been an issue that has come up in a number of evidence sessions um, and I would be slightly concerned that we are maybe drifting into a position where we're going to get some uh, statutory guidance through from the department uh, without the committee having had any opportunity to, to, to hear from the department in detail or indeed from other stakeholders. Uh, so if, if we can note that for a uh, forward work plan if members are agreed. Right. Right. Item 7.4, it's an update from the DALO uh, following the concerns that were raised during our uh, briefing session with the Children's Commissioner uh, and I would just want to propose that we, we share that response with the Children's Commissioner uh, at this stage. Are members agreed? Uh, 7.6, that's a response from the DALO regarding funding cuts to Sentinus, um, and I would propose that we forward that on to uh, the organisation. Um, are members agreed? Agreed. agreed. Item 7.7, .7, that's correspondence from the DALO, and that is sharing the uh, Healthy Habits <coughs> pilot post-project evaluation, which was very <coughs> welcome to see coming through. It's a fairly substantial document and I'm going to confess I haven't read it in, in full detail but I have had the opportunity to, to, to have a, a brief look at it. Based on, on that, unless any other members have any other views at this stage, I would want to propose that the committee writes to the Minister highlighting um, the success of the project um, and urging him uh, to, to focus on delivering uh, provision in primary schools uh, as a matter of urgency. Um, and I would also want to highlight that the, the summary of the pilot does seem to note that even with funding and resource going in, demand far uh, outstripped <coughs> supply, uh, and that really there is an urgent need for a policy intervention in this in this space. Uh, are, are members agreed if we write in those terms? Yeah. Agreed. Okay. Item 7.8, uh, that is a response from the EA to our correspondence regarding St Malachy's Youth Centre. Um, I would propose that we, we forward that on to St Malachy's um, and then also to, to note the content of it for when we have the EA uh, in providing a briefing specifically on youth services. Are members agreed? Agreed. Item 7.9, um, this is a request from the uh, Committee <coughs> of Economy uh, seeking a joint meeting with themselves uh, and officials uh, from both uh, DE and DFE on careers guidance and they are proposing that for the 29th of May uh, 2024 and I think we can see from other correspondence that uh, permission has been granted by the Speaker to allow that session uh, if agreed to take place in, in the uh, Assembly Plenary Chamber. So I would propose that I respond uh, to the Chair of the Economy Committee confirming that we are agreed to, to having a joint meeting uh, and that then subsequent to that I can liaise with the Chair around timings, logistics, particularly around who, which, which committee chair chairs the meeting and who takes Deputy Chair uh, to take that forward. Are members agreed? Agreed. Item 7.13, correspondence from Young Enterprise uh, requesting to brief the committee on the work that they currently undertake. Um, I would propose that we invite them to an informal briefing. Um, I'm sure other members have had engagement with them. I've certainly had, had some really positive engagements uh, with Young Enterprise at a number of their events, and I think it would be good to hear from them. Are members agreed? Mm -hmm. Agreed. Okay. Items 7.14 and 7.23, correspondence from the History Teachers Association of Northern Ireland also requesting an opportunity to brief the committee. And again, I would be uh, content to invite them to an informal uh, briefing session uh, of the committee. Are members agreed? Yep, agreed. Okay. 7.15, correspondence from the Youth Assembly, uh, and that was uh, stating their interest in getting involved in a youth uh, engagement event, um, and also requesting that the committee meet with members of the Youth Assembly for uh, lunch prior to one of our committee sessions. So I would propose that we, we write back to them and thank them for their interest in, in ongoing <coughs> engagement uh, and confirm that we're, we're very happy to facilitate that and that we'll be in touch with, uh, with potential dates uh, over the next number of weeks. Members agreed? Agreed. Item 7.16, request from NICMA, Northern Ireland Child Minders Association, to brief the committee on a number of issues uh, affecting the child minding sector. Um, I would propose that we acknowledge and thank NICMA for their request, um, and then we, that we do, and we can look, consider this at forward work planning if needed, but that we invite uh, them to brief us uh, at, at a, a formal sitting of the, of the committee when we are next receiving evidence on the early learning and child care strategy to try and align those issues. Uh, members agreed? Agreed. Item 7.17, uh, Diverse Youth NI, um, they have shared their proposals and recommendations on educational policy and children's services. Um, it's uh, 
really as a follow on from our, our session um, with, that we had with, with youth stakeholders. So I had proposed that we, we share those uh, <coughs> recommendations with the department. Um, our members agreed. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Um, and other than that, our members content that we dispose of correspondence as per the summary note at page 19 of table papers. Is that agreed? Agreed. Okay. That is us through. And are we ready for, for the department? If you're happy to bring them through, that would be great. Thank you. Afternoon, everybody. I'll just let you get let, let you get settled there. Okay. So, uh, good afternoon, uh, and I would just begin by referring members to the briefing paper from the committee clerk, and that's at page eighteen uh, uh, of your papers, and then also from the the, the paper um, submitted by the department at page six of your tabled papers. So good afternoon and welcome. Um, it's uh, lovely to have you all here at, uh, at, at committee again. So if I could just formally uh, welcome uh, Janice Scallon, Director of Inclusion at the Department, uh, Lorraine Brown, Head of Special, Special Education, Early Years and Pupil Support in the Department, uh, Julie McBride, Head of Special Education Review Team in the Department, uh, and Brenda Shearer, Head of Special Education and Inclusion Policy at the Department. So uh, we would be asking you to, to uh, bring a presentation to us of up to 10 minutes um, and then we will move into questions from members. So it's over to you at this stage. Thank you, Chair. I um, could just take the opportunity to thank the committee for the opportunity to attend today to brief you on the work of my directorate. You've all, I'm about to repeat what you've just said, Chair. I have three small, very small teams. I'm an inclusion directorate. A um, special education review team is headed by Julie McBride to my left, and they lead on the end-to-end -end review of special educational needs and implementation on the SEND framework. Special Education Early Years and Pupil Support Team is led by Lorraine Brown to my left, um, who leads on SEND placements, um, early intervention in the early years and pupil support services. And the Special Education and Inclusion Policy Team headed by Brenda Shearer to Julie's right, who leads on current SEND policy and the development of a new inclusion policy for the department. Um, the department's vision, as you'll already know, is that every child is happy learning and succeeding, and this is no different, nor should it be, for our children and young people with special educational needs and or disability. But we recognise that over recent years, effective delivery of SEND policy has been hindered by significant challenges, leading to a lack of confidence in the system and its ability to respond to the needs of children and young people and their parents. The existing system was established at a time when the pupil population profile was very different in terms of both the numbers of children and young people presenting with SEND and the nature of their needs. There's no doubt that our education landscape has changed significantly, especially in recent years, and the trends we're seeing today are similar to those being experienced across other regions. Since 2017-18, which was the, t the academic year following the initial Northern Ireland Audit Office SEN report, the number of children with statements of special educational needs has risen by 51%, alongside an increase of 25% in children attending our special schools. Over that same time period, expenditure to provide support for children and young people who have or may have SEND has increased from £254 million in 2017-18 to 490 million in 22-23, with a forecasted expenditure of 544 million for 23-24. Following the initial Northern Ireland Audit Office SEN report in 2017, there have been several other scrutiny reports, and most recently the Independent Review of Education, which have considered the changing profile of our population and made a wide range of recommendations for transformation for children and young people with SEN across the wider education system. These reports have pointed to the need for a more responsive system of early intervention that places children at the centre and meets their needs at the earliest possible opportunity. It's clear from the reports that parents, carers, teaching and wider staff often don't have confidence 
that children's needs will be met early enough, and an assessment and subsequent statement of special educational needs is often perceived as the only way of securing the additional supports that children need to aid their learning. It is also clear that the intent outlined within the 1998 Code of Practice for Identification and Assessment of SEN in relation to the graduated response, and I am happy to take questions on that later, um, has not been supported by sufficient investment at school level to build the confidence <coughs> and capacity of our teachers and support staff. The experience of the last few years regarding the placement of children with SEN also clearly demonstrates the need for better and longer term planning in line with projected need to ensure that children can access their education in an appropriate setting alongside their peers and be assured of the necessary support to meet their needs within that setting. There is therefore a strong case for systemic reform, driven by a changing educational landscape, detailed evidence of the range of shortcomings in the system and ultimately the urgent need to improve the experiences and outcomes of our children and young people with SEND. The Department's response to this has been the commencement of the end-to-end -end review of special educational needs. This is a joint Department of Education and Education Authority transformation programme that will identify the changes needed and drive reform right across the education system. The review will bring forward an implementation plan which will include actions on how we speak about, how we plan for and how we deliver services to support our children and young people with SEND. The plan will focus on a framework that will ensure children and young people with SEND get the right support from the right people at the right time and in the right place. And while the committee has endorsed this mantra, I thought it would be helpful to explain what is meant by the four broad aims. In terms of right support, that means high quality, efficient and effective support that is evidence informed and evidence based. By right people, we mean confident and highly skilled teaching and support staff who can access additional support to complement and enhance their practice in the classroom. By right time, we mean effective early identification of needs and early intervention to meet those needs. And by right place, we mean appropriate and timely placements that effectively meet the needs of every child and provide an appropriate learning environment. While it's clear there's a significant amount of change required across the system and we currently sit on over 200 recommendations, most of which fall under those four rights that I've just mentioned, the Department is committed to taking forward early action as this review progresses that will result in change for those children and young people within the system today. Alongside plans for investment in the longer term, this focus on the here and now will require <coughs> significant investment and also political support, and I'm delighted that this issue has had cross-party support both within the Assembly and at the Executive, and I want to thank the Committee for being so supportive <coughs> in this space to date and for, for prioritising our children with special educational needs. And that concludes my opening statement. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, uh, Janice, and I think it is uh, it is fair to say that the, the Committee has uh, we've referenced this uh, on a number of occasions. We made it very clear from the outset that SEN was key priority for us and that we would maintain a focus on that for the duration of this mandate. So it is not a sort of opening issue that we, we want to, to give a brief look at. It is something that we will be focusing on for the for the uh, for the whole of the mandate. Um, and it is it's it is good to have uh, both yourselves and the EA in today so that we can we can look at these issues in a little bit more detail. Um, I, I wanted just to ask by one of the, the things that sort of stood out for me in your briefing paper um, was that the figure of a 114% increase in spend over the last number of years on SEN. I mean that that's a substantial increase in spend, um, and we've heard a lot heard a lot from the minister that that he feels he needs more resource and, and more more money on this. C can I ask what what has that additional resource been spent on, and why has it not been making the difference that we need it to? Well, we've got as I've said. I mean, it's it, the, the forecast expenditure for twenty three twenty four not finalised yet is five hundred and forty four million. Um, We've had an exponential increase in the number of children coming through our system with special educational needs. So because the system is demand-led, then we have to prioritise that and move the money accordingly, and that's what the current bill is. Um, in terms of 
I want to just set down some figures around comparisons, if that's okay, because I know there have been questions previously around comparisons with other jurisdictions. The first thing I would say is I don't think it's fair to make a like-for-like -like comparison between Northern Ireland and other regions because we operate different systems. And I think the figure in England was something equating to 20,000 per capita for children with saying. That's based on those children that have high additional needs with saying, and it also includes health costs. Our costs don't. So the figure here, the latest figure that I have, is that our per capita rate, albeit a crude rate, I wouldn't use that across the board because some of our children have very minimal needs and some have a real multiplicity of need. So there will be significant variation in the distribution of spend for each <coughs> child. But our average is sitting at around 19,000 per child. If I have understood that correctly, that 114% increase in spend, that really relates to dealing with increased demand. It doesn't relate to anything being put in place to alter the system in any way. It's been just about dealing with demand as it comes through. That's about keeping the system steady and providing the services that we need to provide for each of the children in accordance with the needs either that are outlined in their statement or those children that are on the same register. So in that, in that same period of time then, where we were looking at that 114% increase in spend, what, what, what amount of additional resource had been put into actually addressing the systemic issues? I might have to come back to you yeah. with the detail on that, if that's okay. I'm happy to come back to you. I think for me the concern is just that we, we appear to be entirely on a crisis footing at, at every stage through this process. and. I feel we are there again. We were in a crisis setting again, um, mm -hmm. and I think the figures around the additional uh, places that are required, the additional classes that need to be created, are, are really, really concerning. So, on, on that basis, I mean, can you give us any sense of how many children you anticipate at this stage will be without a placement in September? In terms of placements, yeah, I can. Placements. So, the latest figures that I have around same placements, and I will ask if Lorraine wants to come in with any detail in case there's anything I've missed. So, look. <laughs> In the interest of being open and transparent, we've said repeatedly that the position remains challenging for September 24. The current plan and assumptions are that there's a need for an additional 1,000 places. So just to put that in context, the number of children that will require a new placement or a change of placement is around 7,000 children. So. 6,000 of those children will be placed in accordance with their needs, but there's a need for an additional 1,000 places to meet the pressures. Um, what that equates to then is um, 66 new special school classes and around 94 new specialist provisions in mainstream. Um, so we do, we, we, I don't want to use the word crisis here. It is challenging, but I don't want to give the impression that no work has been done in this space. There has been an extensive amount of work done in this space. So the Education Authority have written out to every school. And just to give a sense of the capacity in our system, there are around 30,000 available places that exist in our mainstream schools. So the Education Authority have, have <coughs> written out to every single school. They have got a response um, from a low number of schools and have been contacting to date the latest figures I have around 291 schools have been contacted individually that are in areas of pressure of those around 134 have said no to creating specialist provision uh, 80 have said yes and that is being progressed actively within the education authority and the remaining around 54 schools haven't been prescriptive either way. Um, in terms of the specialist provisions that exist, and that's 6% of our children in Northern Ireland are educated in a specialist provision. The vast majority of children with special educational needs are educated in a, main, in a mainstream class in a mainstream school, <coughs> with around 10% educated in special schools. But specialist provisions in mainstream constitute around 6%. Around 3,174 children are educated in a specialist provision in a mainstream school. So that's quite a small percentage of the overall um, cohort of children and the overall cohort of children with special educational needs. 100% of the children in specialist provision in mainstream schools are educated 
in 20% of our schools. So the work that's being done currently is to create more capacity across the entire system. It's really important that our schools join us in this space and are supported to do so. I understand we've been on visits to specialist provisions in mainstream schools. I've gone out with the team to talk to those who have specialist provisions. I appreciate that for some it's working incredibly well and when you see it in practice you can see how it's completely life-changing for those children. For some of the schools it was a rocky road to get to that point but largely down to logistics of actually getting the accommodation in place. So when we say getting ahead of need and getting ahead in advance of need, each place may require accommodation and that takes time. So putting all of that together, that's the challenge that we face. We're still in the process and the Education Authority, I'm sure we'll talk about this in more detail later, but we're still <coughs> in the process of contacting schools individually. And for on record, I am more than happy to speak to any individual school who wants to work in this space with us because a specialist provision for a child can be life-changing for them, simply putting them in a calmer environment that allows, them, that allows us to reduce and remove the barriers to their education that a busy classroom brings and allowing them to access the curriculum. I have, I have no doubt, and I've visited um, in my own constituency, settings where, where that is working really well, but I am also aware of settings where there have been real problems and, and mm -hmm. the, 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 the lack of support has been, has been really evident. Uh, I think other members are going to, I'm sure, have questions on SPIM specifically, so I will leave that for other members. I would just want to really finish with that, and I, and I don't want to have to be asking this question. H how do we avoid being in this position next year? Because this feels like an annual cycle, yeah. and, I, and it's, it just, it's entirely unacceptable that our children with special educational needs are, are, are dealt with in this way. Um, and I'm not suggesting that there has been any lack of... Uh, good intent to try and sort the situation out but it feels to me that the planning has still not been good enough and I really would like to just get a, get some clarity. How do we avoid being in this position, in this room, in a year's time, having the same conversation? Okay. So I think we have an opportunity. I sit on the Area Planning Strategic Group. I'm currently meeting with each of the managing authorities and special uh, and, and, and sectoral support bodies to talk to them specifically about the work that they're doing with the schools that they represent to encourage more schools to step into this space for the future. Now, not necessarily for September 24, but for September 25, 26 and beyond. But we do have a critical opportunity now in terms of area planning to make sure that the next operational plan, which is due to be released in June, prioritises special educational needs, but that it also <coughs> plans in line with projected need. The way the process has worked with the previous operational plan <coughs> is that, and I do need to get into process here, um, because it is a statutory process for children with special educational needs. So for those children, I think I spoke about this at the previous committee I attended, for children in P7 moving to <coughs> Year 8 who have a statement, each of those children needs to go through a transitional review. So. That's an individual meeting about that child with all of the adults involved with that child and all of the professional bodies. If that requires a change in placement, which <coughs> all of them will, so it'll be a change in placement from primary school to post-primary school, either in mainstream or in a specialist provision or transitioning into a special school. That requires an amendment to that child's statement. It has to go back to the education authority to be reviewed by educational psychology to determine the placement for that child. Once that placement has been determined, there'll either be a place or there won't be a place. So naming something on naming the school on the statement is difficult if there's no provision in place. That's why we need our entire school system to step into this place so that there are places for those children and they can be named quickly. It's a tripartite decision for each child with the parents. I need to finish the parents the school involved and the education authority. So the educational psychologist decides what the appropriate placement is. That then <coughs> goes to the school. The school can say yes or no. We do, we do understand that process. Yeah. Um, I, so, I suppose that what I'm not hearing is what do we do with that process to ensure it's working because it doesn't feel like so, it is. 
Under the end-to-end -end review, we have a work stream on the statementing process, which includes the annual review process, trying to look at how we can streamline, within the legislation that we've got, trying to streamline that process to make it better. But I have to go back to area planning. If we can put the places in place, in advance, and in line with the projected need, then we won't see that bottleneck once a provision is decided the place should be there for the child and that's where that the operation through area planning this year is that the intention that's <laughs> where the operational plan is the biggest opportunity that we have to make sure that instead of waiting until the placement the placement need has been identified to go to area plan and local groups and they then work to put placements in place that actually we completely flip that and the area planning local groups are aware of the projections get ahead of the numbers get the places there so that the process then doesn't become the problem. We will watch this space with interest. Um, I'm going to hand over to the to the Deputy Chair here and I'm, I'm going to um, say given the time we're on, um, we, we probably do need to be moving through our meetings a bit more rapidly than we have, so I'm going to say seven, <coughs> seven minutes for each contribution here. Okay, thanks. Just uh, interview. Is thanks, John. And, I'll bring you in. Uh, and the, the last time you were in with uh, Lindsay, Lindsay Farrell, I asked Lindsay what was the difference between the multidisciplinary teams and the local integrated teams, and uh, she said it was only a matter of language. Mm -hmm. that's, not, that's not factually accurate, sure it's not. At my understanding, Pat, is, and I've checked this with the Education Authority, and we've checked mm -hmm. through all the previous paperwork on this, um, a multidisciplinary team is understood out there as having a diff all different <coughs> professionals, including health, education and anyone else that might be involved. That's the true meaning of a multidisciplinary team. When the local integrated teams were set up, they were referred to as multidisciplinary teams. But what the project actually is, is looking at those individual education authority pupil support services, consolidating those services and wrapping those services, happy to elaborate on that, wrap, wrapping those services around the child from an education perspective. So the name was changed to local integrated teams to, to avoid any misapprehension out there that they would be involving speech and language, allied health professionals, occupational therapy, physiotherapy. There's similar work being done by allied health <coughs> professionals on consolidating their model of provision and working out what the best model of provision is. And that's acknowledged by our health colleagues. That AHP service services were designed with a totally different system that we had years you ago. See, and needs you see, to you're flex. losing me there, Janice, because you clearly defined what a multidisciplinary team is and should be. Mm -hmm. uh, it involves educationalists and involves uh, people from a health background. Uh, now, what is, what is it exactly that we're getting? The local integrated teams? Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. So, what, what, what exactly is it? Who's okay. going to be involved in it? So at the minute, there are seven separate and distinct EA pupil support services <coughs> that are provided to children. And the way that a child gets access to one or more of those pupil support services is through a referral system that has to come in through an educational psychologist and then is channeled out to each one of those teams. So if you have a child that is autistic, has a literacy difficulty and potentially might need behaviour support, that's three referrals for that, three separate referrals for that child come to educational psychology, three separate assessments. Each one then goes to the appropriate team. It may end up on a waiting list, depending on what the volume of, of children needing that particular support service are, or they may get seen straight away. Behaviour support will go out to the child. Education, um, the autism intervention service will go out to the child, and the literacy support service will go out to the child separately. So you may have three different people engaging with that child on the same day, on different days, weeks apart, with three separate care plans for that child that aren't integrated, that don't actually mesh together to provide the best support for that child. The parent, the school, the teacher, 
the classroom assistant has to cope with those three separate care plans and work out how best to provide for that child. Three separate streams of advice. You can imagine the administration. So the local integrated teams are actually, one, removing the gateway for educational psychology so a school can refer directly into a regional, as I understand it, Judy, <coughs> right, a regional hub and not through an educational psychologist. The school can make the decision and they won't have to do those three separate referrals. It will be one child-centred referral that goes into a regional hub and a, I was about to say multidisciplinary, an integrated team <coughs> will then make the decision how to wrap those three services around that child, around the school and provide a consolidated plan for the intervention with that child that's not on wheel day. So it's child-centred as opposed okay, to service-centred. It requires collaboration between health and education. It will do, yes, yes. absolutely. And, and, and what, what role are health playing in this? They have their separate and distinct, very similar scenario, they have their separate and distinct allied health professional services. So that could be speech and language, occupational therapy, um, and physiotherapy. So they are doing a similar exercise in health to look at their model of provision to work out how to better wrap their services around a child. And we have a joint health ed education oversight group that will bring these two things together to ensure that when the time comes, while they're being developed in parallel, we're represented on health groups, health are represented and, and, on education and when, groups. When, when do we, we expect those to be up and running? I can't put an exact on the local integrated team September twenty four. I can't put a time frame on the health. I don't have a date for that. Okay, I'll move on anyway. Uh, in, in terms of well, you said you've written just a yeah. couple of a couple of quick ones. Uh, <coughs> you say you've written out to every school or every school has been written to. The education. Uh, some has, have yes. uh, responded in the negative. Others have said they're willing to take special needs. How many grammar schools have said they'll take uh, children with special needs? I would have to check that for you. I do, I do have the information from the Education Authority, but not with me today. I know, Pat, there are a number. I have a meeting set up with the Governing Bodies Association, but I know that there are a number of grammar schools that have come forward. I don't have the exact okay. number. And well, I don't could could you give me that and give me what percentage it is of I grammar schools? And can, just, just yes. finally, uh, the independent review suggests that uh, a SEND first, first approach in terms of placements has the EA or the department considered that? Absolutely. So this is part of... Um, so the Ipsos review recommended that children shouldn't be supernumerary, as did the Independent Review of Education. And, and in fact, I'm just out of a meeting there now about that <coughs> thing. So um, we've been considering this for quite some time in the department. Um, and we are at a point where we're firming up recommendations to bring through our top management group, both myself as Director of Inclusion capital side are involved and the area planning the director of sustainable schools be bringing recommendations to the minister on that so we can see what the, if the AA can help with the, the data on the on the grammar school as well when they're in okay uh kate you were in next uh thank you chair um janice i want to pick up on something you said about it not being a crisis for a thousand children who are not going to have a place it is a crisis and i'm very concerned about the ping-pong attitude between the department and the EA, we start with the pay and grading review. I mean, I don't even know who's to blame for that. And now it feels like it's being put on the schools. And if I were a parent and I helped so many of them last summer, I would be so concerned and I wouldn't be hearing anything to be optimistic about right now. And what I am hearing from parents is there needs to be more communication. So what are you doing around that? Um, and the uh, the the end to end review. I mean, the the dates for that, the timeline for that, and how are you communicating with the people who are going to be impacted by this, and who we are going to be representing in a couple of months' time? I'm I'm very concerned about it, and it is a crisis for a thousand children. It is a crisis. Okay. No, the thousand the thousand places places. So it's not a thousand children, it's a thousand places. So that's based on an assumption of projections coming forward. That's not individual children who are currently without a place. So we just need to be clear on that. Okay. Um, in terms of what I said around a crisis, I, I, it's, when I think about things being a crisis, it's nearly like an unknown. 
we do know that these pressures are here. <coughs> we are working to resolve the pressures. I know for each individual child that that can be catastrophic <coughs> for them, and it is worrying, and it is very anxiety for the, for the parents that are involved. Of course, it's a state of anxiety for them, wondering what the future will hold. But I can assure those parents and assure the committee that work is ongoing every day between my team and the department and those in the Education Authority working in this space. And we do have to work with our schools because that's where the places are and that's where the places need to be. We can write down words on a page, we can put a plan on a page, but if we don't ultimately physically create spaces in our schools, then they won't be there. So I'm not blaming anyone. I'm saying that it's important that everyone pulls in the same direction here. Um, so I'm simply laying out the facts in terms of the number of schools that have come into the space with us and are willing to support our children with special educational needs and those that haven't. But we continue to work in that space. In terms of the end-to-end -end review, we're currently in the engagement phase. Um, part of that, actually, saying Reform NI are working with us um, to have engagement directly with parents on that very thing, on the placements issue. So we are communicating <coughs> widely with our stakeholders and our schools. Um, all of the 12 work streams in the end-to-end -end review are in their engagement phase at the moment. And I don't know, Julie, if you want, if any of the staff want to elaborate on the engagement that you've had with people. Julie, do you want to? Yeah, I mean, you're right. Trying to um, contact all the parents of children with is quite difficult. So we do try to use different methods through Facebook, through even the departmental websites, through our own working groups that we have and through all the, the various departments. Um, we are trying to pull together a newsletter, if you like, which will go out to all schools. And we will put on um, all the parent groups and websites, again, on the department websites. And on that is a code that the parents can actually um, click on and it tells them about the work streams. It gives a definition of what that work stream covers and then they, the parents can indicate if they want to be involved and we have done that. I, uh, sorry, and I, I should probably make it clear, it's, it's not just how you're communicating with them, it's the level of detail within that because the parents have been asked to put all their faith in this yeah. process so they need to know that something is going to deliver within it. So it's not just... The means, by, but it's it's the level yeah. of detail. You're absolutely it. right, and one of the things that has just closed is a transition survey. So for children transitioning from education to adulthood, we have just um, completed the survey on that. And funny, if I was just talking yesterday, we need now, now to put something out to say to the parents who contributed. Thanks very much. Here's where we are, and here's our plan of moving forward, so they know that they're being listened to. And then we will obviously publish the results from um, from that survey finding. So that's one way. You're absolutely right. There's no point in us going out and just asking for information if parents know that we're not doing anything with it. You know, so that communication needs to continue ongoing. Okay, thank you. And then just the the last point I'd like to make, Chair, is in relation to the allied health professionals, which. Um, uh, uh, Pat has already touched on. I have been to Surlas and Mancap, two amazing um, centres in my constituency, and it is shocking to go into one classroom, which is right next door to the other classroom, and the one classroom, they have access to the speech and language therapist and everything they need, and you go into the next classroom, and they have to go back out into the community, often to see the people who are looking after them there. So I think we do need... It's welcome that there is work happening. We need to have a date, and maybe the next time we have a conversation, you'll be able to update us when we can have a date of when this will be addressed, because it's ridiculous. Yeah, if I can come in on that, Kate, I mean, that's something we're totally alive to that, and that's why the Joint Health Education Oversight Forum has been set up, because we are aware that health are trying to transform their model, education are trying to transform their model of pupil support. The whole point here is the pupils are supported wherever they are. And that's not just the case. And we fund, actually, the provisions in Mencap and Solis and two others, actually, non specialty <coughs> provisions, and they are going incredibly well, yes. um, providing an excellent service to children. But yes, that is the case. We have seen that. So the children in the ordinary Mencap provision are accessing all of those allied health professionals, and the children in the provision that we have there can't access them, have to go out into the community. That's the same in a lot of our, in, in a lot of our specialist provisions and mainstream school as well, where the children have to go out into the community and the same as those children who require speech and language <coughs> or other allied health professional services that are in a mainstream class. So they may be in the appropriate educational provision, but they may not be able to access allied health professional um, provision in school and they have to go out to clinic or they have to go out to community. So it's absolutely something that we're looking at in that space that children can be provided the service wherever they are. And if that's in school, then that's where it needs to be provided. But there is a significant transformation of that allied health professional model that needs to happen to enable that to happen. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. David, you're next. 
Thanks, Chair. I don't plan to take up the full seven minutes because uh, actually the two themes that it was coming to, Pat does, has covered already. But um, just to probably on the back of what Pat did, um, said to reinforce, I guess, the idea, and I think we're, we're um, in agreement on this, is, is that I still, after hearing it raised a few times at the committee, I'm not convinced as to why there is the need or why, it's be, why it is that these two sort of teams are being individually um, sort of put in place it, 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 <clears throat> and why that I, I worry <clears throat> I'm happy to hear why it's not the case but I worry that for a child centred approach you would wrap around both those aspects of care around the child at the same time and it would work much better if you I don't see why you would um, cultivate those separately um, I understand that there's an overseeing group and hopefully that helps knit it together but it feels more departmental and staff centred to develop it in such a way where it's perhaps more comfortable for the siloed sort of uh, operation that we've been used to at times to operate in that way and, and, and develop their own teams with you know the that which the the the, the ecosystem within they're they're more familiar I guess mm -hmm. um, and I just perhaps you can speak to why that it may be the case or why why it's preferable to develop it in that uh, sort of separate way because I still do think and I think well, that's what Pat was trying to say that actually it makes much more sense if we have two departments developing very similar sort of wraparound care for a child why would you not collaborate more fulsomely at, and, and put that together at, at the same time and I'll, I'll just ask the same question uh, or I'll ask question I was going to come to, I know uh, Danny usually raises around the profile of those schools and hopefully when you're giving that to Pat you can pass it on to us all in terms of the schools uh, and, and who's saying yes and who's saying no in that sense. But <clears throat> perhaps anecdotally even um, you can give us an idea if there has been feedback as to what reasons the schools that are saying no are, say, are, are saying no. Is it just a, a flat no, that's not what we want, thank you very much. Or is it concerns that they are raising around support? We understand that schools need to be supported in order to make this happen, but there also needs to be an understanding across the system that things are not perfect at the moment, the resource is not everything that we want it to be, and therefore everyone does have to pull together and try to shoulder some of the weight uh, as well. So. Yeah, so uh, can I come to that one first? Yes, and then I'll yeah, come sure. back and say about the local integrated teams. <coughs> so look, the overall aim when we look at the long-term transformation of the special educational needs system is that children's needs will be met whether they have a statement or not um, and that if we are identifying needs early enough and meeting those needs whatever those needs are whether they're speech and language whether they're sensory services whether they're literacy services that those needs are met at the earliest possible opportunity and that people don't need to go as far as getting a statement. There'll always be children that will need to have a legal document that outlines their educational and non-educational needs, and they're separate in the statement as it currently stands. But um, you're absolutely correct. You know, the as I've already said, you know, all of the children educated in our specialist provisions in mainstream, that's 20% of our schools. So the schools that have come forward and said no, when I'm getting this information on a regular basis, I meet with my counterpart in the Education Authority every Monday morning. Um, and it's a variety of reasons, and, and it is anecdotal, so it, I don't want to seem pejorative on any schools, but yes. Nervousness around, we've never done this before. What does it entail? What support will we get? What is a specialist provision, actually, is something that has been said. So a complete no knowledge of what this actually is so in that regard the communication needs to be much much better about what this is um previous experience of having set up a unit way back in the day was what they were called i mean specialist provisions have been around for decades they're not a new phenomenon we've just had a lot more of them in recent years because that's the profile of the children that's coming through and I've said before our whole system needs to flex to meet the profile of our children. Children shouldn't be expected to fit our system. <laughs> that's just the wrong way around. Um, but yes, previous experience of having set up provisions and not getting the right support, not having enough flexibility around what that provision looks like, the staffing that's in it, the people, the adults that are in there, not getting outside additional support, not feeling confident and capable to meet the needs of the children. Um, and 
some schools in fairness that have said no it's more a case of well we don't have accommodation we can't actually we're, we're absolutely full we can't put a specialist provision unless we physically build it so there's varying reasons some I have to be perfectly honest have just said they're just not interested um, and that's where I think we need to get more involved and I yeah, have absolutely. spoken regularly with colleagues in education authority and, and publicly that I would be more than willing to meet with every school or any school in this space um, we need to put the package together more succinctly and the education authority did send out with their letter <coughs> what a specialist provision is what support you can expect to receive when you set this up um, but some schools have stepped into the space some haven't um, due to largely logistical factors and previous experience in also the also there's no one obviously there's what's optimal and, and, and what's not but there's, there's full and there's full because i've been to spe- i've been to special school in my constituency where the the storage cupboards have been made into te- the, uh, they are they are literally mm-hmm. packed to the brim and i suspect mm-hmm. that there are other schools that are you know full in terms of they've they filled their capacity but i suspect have much greater facilities and and space than than the the special school that, that i would be referring to who are largely in temporary sort of modular um buildings and 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 using every inch of space that they can and it's uh, if 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 there is pressure on some schools to operate above what is optimal for them, mm-hmm. certainly that pressure shouldn't be applied just to one one or, or those schools that are willing, but actually everyone should be expected to bear some of the weight. But of course, <clears throat> with reference to whether that school is best fitted to meet the needs of that child yes. relative to what's available. Um, and then just, just on that sort of... The you've, you've used your time. Well, it's, not, it's, not, it's, 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 it's more asking for the answer to the question that they asked around, or around the... Why we the local integrator? Do, doing that separately is there a reason? Even briefly, I mean, we do merge those. I mean, yes, it is two separate departments, you know. Um, but we do communicate regularly with our health, yeah. with our counterparts in health, and all of our, I mean, our allied health professionals, PHA folks, are represented yeah. on our education groups right throughout the governance structures that are there, right up to the to say and strategic oversight group has the grade three in the Department of Health on there. We have grade five on the SEN, the DE, EA, SEN program board, and likewise we sit on their groups. So there is <coughs> constant collaboration in this space. We do operate in separate structures. Um, we have one education authority and a range of other ALBs in the department. Um, health have different health trusts and they have structures within those trusts. So it's important that they get their consolidation right and that we get our consolidation right with a view to collaborating together. While it's being done in parallel, it's not being done separately. We're still collaborating very much with a view to these things being able to be dovetailed at the point at which they're ready. But I think it's important for each of those health services and education services to get their own models in place that are going to wrap around a child with a view then to dovetailing them in the future. To do that now, I think, would be really unwieldy. Okay. And if I could just add there, I think there's the issue of data. Um, it does keep coming up when you speak to the EA that they feel that they don't get the data they need from the from the health trusts in, in adequate time for children who are on the health service radar very, very early on. So again, I think you know the next time perhaps that, that you are before committee or again if we can get something you know from, from yourselves, what what is maybe not to cover right now, but to, to follow up um, because I think it may be an issue of, I think it may be an issue to be honest of presentation as much as anything else because I think I'm willing you know to believe that there's nuances that we're less across and less aware of the people working within departments will be more aware of mm-hmm. absolutely it was just as a committee and especially as, as people new to this committee it's trying to get an understanding of why that maybe doesn't look the way we would we would think it should so it's just okay. in terms of the data piece um so health as i said my my counterpart in the department of health is represented on the deea SEN program board and at the last meeting, we had a full presentation on those very thing, all of those structures and health, so that we can understand that better, and and the the confines with it within which they work. Um, but one of the good actions to come out of that, we did discuss data at length at that meeting. So there is a meeting coming up um, with our BSO, business services organisation, statisticians. 
So we've already made contact and we want to sit down now to look to see, I can't remember the exact name of the team, I can't remember the name of the team, but the BSO statisticians, we're due to meet with them ourselves in education to look at the data that they have and how we can utilise that and how we can share that. And then again, we've always signalled up the need for that um, very, very early years. The children that we don't know getting that very early years data to us at the earliest point so that again that helps the planning in advance. It's really critical for getting ahead Absolutely. of this because it felt last year that there were a lot of surprises suddenly of oh, that, you know, in terms of the demand for, for places in, in preschool settings and that just should not be the case. You know, Those children surely must have been known to health. And it, it's hard I think for us to some, understand how that Some how of them, that, yeah, that, some that of them will be, Chair. Some of those yeah. children will be known to health. A lot of them won't be known to health. And I think in the last couple of years, um, we have to think about the COVID babies. So the COVID babies are in our schools now and we're coming into preschool last year and we're coming into P1 last year. So a lot of those children, because of the COVID period, didn't see a health visitor, didn't see an allied health professional. So a lot of those children would not have been known to health. So I just really do need to clarify that point. But moving forward, that's all back in train. <coughs> we should be back in train now. Health visiting, allied health professionals, children being referred by GPs. That wasn't the case during the COVID period. So that's a reason for what the spike that we saw last year, to be fair. Thanks. Robbie? Thank you. I'm uh, going to start off and be unusually controversial, if you don't mind. Um, we have in the existing orders and, and acts the presumption of mainstream, and I think that's wrong. I think that isn't child focused. I don't think it's child centred. I don't think in that presumption of mainstream that it, if the <coughs> presumption of mainstream is before the child presents, then um, it can affect the choices that a parent and, and the team around it make in regard to the right school for that child. And I think that adds into our P1 <coughs> issue every year because what we are faced with as MLAs and as public representatives is the disconnect between parents and EA and probably yourselves in terms of which school is best for that child. This is supposed to get the best setting for the child. And I, I, I'm concerned at the moment now with, with, with what the Minister has said and what's been presented at times. We seem to be moving, even before the end, the end review is complete, towards the SPIMS and, and mainstream and, and, the, and that being the best place for um, these children. And I think it's an inefficiency. I'm not saying of this absolutely bottom out, but I also think it's a bit of an inefficiency. We don't have enough uh, child psychologists. We don't have enough speech and language therapists. We don't have enough occupational therapists to ground multiple, 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 multiple sites. So if we don't have that, how can we ever join it together if we don't have the workforce? And if the, the very start of the journey for the child, we have the added difficulty where it's a presumption of mainstream before we start, kind of. Um, so given that, um, I'm also going to sort of challenge some of the figures here. 1,000 pupils this year look in a placement P1, but that is around 9... Eight, eight, or sorry, 1,000... 1,000 uh, places thousand required across required. the board. 7,000 out of 7,000 7, places, which is around 19%, which is what is a known known. How is, that an, how is that an additional challenge this year if it's a known known? If that is around the same figure as what we have in school, which is 19% going to figures, how is that presenting any more greater difficulty this year than any other year? It sounds very much to me like the same figure. Well, those children, first of all, that 19% that you're referring to, they're statement to children. Mm -hmm. So the 19% that you refer to across the whole coast, across the whole cohort aren't statement to. That's all of the children on the same register. 28% are the children who present either statement or not. 7% yeah. in, our, in our system are statement to. Okay. 19% so, are on the same register. Yes, on the same register, yes. So, so, and that'll be the same. So and the vast majority of those children, 85% of those children, are in mainstream schools. So when we talk about a presumption of mainstream, 85% of our children with special educational needs, whether they have a statement or not, are in mainstream schools. Mm -hmm. Only 7% of our pupil cohort has a statement of yeah, special Because we get focused on the statement, which isn't the, because it's the behaviours of the child and, mm -hmm. the, and the outcomes for the child that's important. Mm -hmm. So the statement is a, almost a misnomer, I think, in, in some ways, although some of the support follows a statement. In some cases, in some cases the perception is that the statement is the only route yeah. to get support. And that has evolved over the years because of what I said earlier, if a child's needs are not being met, and many children, bear in mind 85% of our children with special educational needs are educated in a mainstream school, their needs are being so, met so the, without the, the, the need my for My main point statement. then is presumption of mainstream. What has mm -hmm. been, what, when was the last time that that was assessed as in the best interests of the child? 
as in, in terms of um, the, 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 the starting point for an assessment, and we're looking at what is the best, when was, when was the last time it was, it was yeah. looked at and to, to the measure, the outcomes for our children who have It's not needs. a default position. The policy is a presumption of mainstream. That is the terminology, right? We have a presumption of mainstream in terms of all of our children, regardless of special educational need and or disability, have the right to be educated in a mainstream school mm -hmm. alongside their peers and in their community, like other children. They also have but the right for special school. The statement is what decides what the appropriate placement is for those children. So the presumption is there that all children, from an inclusion, an inclusion point of view, that all children have the right to be educated with their peers, alongside their peers, in a mainstream school with equal opportunity to the curriculum and to the learning that all other children that don't have special educational needs get by default. But the statementing process is what decides ultimately what the appropriate placement is for that, school, for that child. And who decides that is based on all of the evidences that go into the statement. That includes contribution from the parents, <coughs> contribution from any medical professionals involved with the child or any other professionals involved with the child, and the educational psychology professionals and the education authority. So when it comes to making a decision, all of that information is assessed by the educational psychologist, and that can include consultant paediatricians, speech and language therapists, physiotherapists, whoever's involved with that child puts all of the advices into that statement. And if you've seen a statement of special education, oh, needs, <coughs> it can run into quite a bundle. So the educational psychologist will assess all of that and decide what the child's needs are. They will also have their own educational based assessments to see what the child's potential capabilities are and decide whether that should be a mainstream school, a specialist provision in a mainstream school or a special school. Once that I just, I, I, my, my time yeah. a minute, yes. if you don't mind, okay, I'm going to jump in. I need to jump so, in. Yeah, I need to yeah, jump yeah. in because yeah. you're as good as a minister here, just filling up my time. <laughs> so, <I'm not> just <laughs> oh, no, no, we only get seven minutes. Sorry. No, you're, no, I'm not shouting at you. I'm just, I just want to get more out of you, if that's okay. Um, in regard, I, so we've heard a lot about the SPIMS and, and, and inclusion. That's fine. I absolutely get that. But we also have a greater complexity of need. We do. So in the best interest of a child, I'm going to go back to that. Are we confident that today in 2024, this is still fit for purpose? That if we have a more compl a greater complexity of need, that the, the, the needs of the child would be picked up without the additional pressures that schools are, are facing? And I know that we need that the, the, we need the multifaceted approach, I get that. Absolutely. But I've heard very little today in regard to what we're going to do to increase the capacity in special school placements. Because if there's a greater complexity of need, then what does that look like for special schools in terms yeah. of the additional classes and new builds? Um, and, and, and finally, just chair, and the last one then is we know how many, we know where they are. Mm -hmm. What's the outcomes for those kids? How, how are we capturing the outcomes for those um, children who go through our education system in either sector in terms of their um, uh, transfer into either work for their education, higher edu education, or uh, the facility where they can just, you know, they get the best support that they can have? Okay. So it's need to be a uh, quick, quick answer, Sorry. but I think yeah. the questions are, I think I mean, we haven't really covered special schools, so I think yeah. it is okay, important Okay, so I did say out. earlier on, in the thousand places that are needed, um, that that requires 66 new special school classes and 94 new specialist provisions in mainstream. So that's covered, that thousand places include special schools. Um, and in terms of solutions, I know you, Lorraine has the figures on them there. In terms of the solutions that we're working through so far, if I'm right, do you mm -hmm. want to come yeah. in on that, Lorraine? Yeah. So the latest update from the EA is that there are solutions for 43 of those 66 special school classes um, and 46 of the 94 SPIMs. There's still a bit of work to do in, in establishing the balance. But that's where we are with that. <coughs> and maybe also just to say in terms of future planning, the operational plan too and the area planning piece that Janice referred to earlier, that will include the special school provision and enhancement of the special school estate where required. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Thank you. Sorry, outcomes. Do you want to tell me? Yeah, so, yes. so under the end to end review, we have an outcomes work stream um, and we're developing an outcomes framework. So this is about 
at the minute we're sitting on over 300 indicators on how we would measure outcomes for okay. children with special educational needs. Um, it's taken me in my happy place. Um, but ultimately we need to whittle that down to get the right measures. I'm very concerned around you, we measure what matters rather than what gets measured gets done. So the outcomes framework is working its way through and we're having a series of ter turning the curve workshops. Happy to come back and elaborate on that. Um, with each of the appropriate professionals involved in that particular area, whether it's right support, whether it's right time, whether it's right place, um, to make sure that we can measure moving forward how we look at the outcomes for children with special and education. And just on that one, just, um, in terms yeah, of gather, we'll gathering to... the voice of the young people, that well, that too have either been through that process or in that process at the moment that we're doing that? I didn't get the first Gathering bit. the voice of the young people to ensure that their Absolutely. voices get into it, you know, that they're either in that Absolutely. Coming towards yes. it, yeah. At uh, every step. Okay. Yes. Sure. I'm going to move on to thank you. Cheryl. Here. Thank you very That's much. The next um, thank you, Sharon. Thanks very much um, for the update. Um, I will be quick. Just in terms of children that cannot attend school or physically or emotionally can't attend school, um, I suppose what action is the department taking to, to bring those children back and to provide them a suitable environment um, so they feel emotionally um ready to for, for education um, another question would be in terms of training for staff whether it be support staff or for teachers you know how do you feel that the department at this stage is actually getting teachers equipped for training for special educational needs or even teachers within a mainstream setting who are not necessarily teaching children with saying but we all know that there is children within those classes and those teachers aren't ed you know they're, they're not trained to, <coughs> to that level so um, I suppose that would be how we would deal with that going forward. Okay, so there's another work stream um, in the end-to-end -end review around workforce development. Mm -hmm. um, but some of the things that we've been doing very recently, I have a meeting coming up. I'll deal with initial teacher education first, I think. Um, no, actually, what I'll say is all teachers are teachers of children with special educational needs because one in five of our children have special educational yeah. needs. They're in every single classroom and always have been. They're there. So a lot of our teachers are already teaching in that space um, but I have a meeting coming up with the higher education institutes to talk about what the offer currently is in our universities for initial teacher education yeah. to make sure that what's in there is reflective of what we need um, I can't really say any more about that right now because I haven't had the meeting yet mm -hmm. um, we also have in terms of continuing professional development for our teaching staff our learning leaders strategy um, and that's something that I think it's out there. It needs to be better articulated. It needs to be better understood amongst our, our, our staff. Um, in terms of our support staff then, our classroom assistants and those supporting our children, they don't have a continuing professional development <coughs> arm, but that's something through the workforce development piece that we're looking at in terms of what knowledge do they come in with? Some of our classroom assistants have degree qualifications in early years development, for example. You know, some are extremely well qualified and know what they're doing. Others don't necessarily have that support. So it's making that support available. And I'm just back from a meeting at Middletown yesterday where we know that there's a lot of training materials there, certainly around autism, that the centre have made available and are more than willing to make available in that space. So we're very alive to the initial teacher education and the continuing professional development of all of our staff. Um, but I would say it's all teachers are teachers of children with special educational needs. Just in terms of the, the higher level education and university, obviously degrees and placements, um, do they require um, students to undertake a placement in special educational needs or is that a choice? It's an option. An option. <laughs> That's something I suppose um, I think w would be key. I think you know we are in a situation now where this is the norm um, and we need to make sure that every teacher is not only trained but confident and willing to and they, they all are but have that confidence there that they can you know do this. So I think from that level there from a training perspective I think that is key that we <coughs> put that into the education um, as a mandatory element but thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, um, Just a couple of things. Um, w one thing I just would like some clarity on, and again, it's, it's probably more for myself, um, just being new to the committee. What's the difference between a thousand places and a thousand children? Would be the first thing. Um, the other 
thing is, and it's just picking up on something that Cheryl said, this our learning leaders strategy, does that include, and I think Janice, I asked you the last time around the team teach specifically, special schools are getting the staff and that are getting this training school a couple of miles down the road with the children that mm -hmm. technically should be in that uh, special school but are in this um, special supervision are not getting that training. Come this September, will those, and I'm, I'm speaking on one school in particular who are coming to me, really, really, really on their knees with this, mm -hmm. will they get that um, come September? Um, in terms of, uh, and I was reading through the notes there, there's eight areas that have been identified that are really under pressure and you did mention that earlier. Janice, what specifically is being done um, in that area? And, and again, I know I see and I don't know if they're in list of order um, of just how under pressure they are, but Dan Patrick is listed in that. And I know from last year where we were sitting um, and, and the parents that were coming in through my office door and, and other colleagues doors as well. Is there something that's being done specifically? I know you might be talking to schools individually and things yeah. like that, but it clearly doesn't seem to be working. The uptake's not there. Is is there something specific there? And then really, really quickly, just um, you mentioned on the early years piece as well. You know, we're talking about early intervention, and, and that's something that's been talked about quite a lot in a lot of different areas around saying, is there something specifically done in the early years? Again, I get that data might not be there, knowing what's coming through, but we do know that there's an upward trend here. We do know that there's more children coming into the system. Is there something being done in terms of the early years strategy um, to, to try and combat this? Sorry, <laughs> she's there. <laughs> um, okay, early years. But, but five minutes down. to cover all of that. <laughs> okay, so. okay, um, okay, in terms of team teach, I'll maybe cover that one first, Cathy. So, yes, I have gone back, when I went back into the department, to look at team teach specifically, right, rather than look at the learning leader strategy, which is sitting there as it is, I went back. So I've gone back to Education Authority colleagues, and actually my own colleagues in the department um, in... I can't remember the name of that director, the Razel, Razley team, um, who are looking after emotional health and wellbeing, restraint and seclusion and all of those things. So that kind of sits with them. So we have had some further information from Team Teach. I've asked specifically that very thing. Do all schools have access to Team Teach training? So there are different tiers of Team Teach training. And I am informed that all mainstream schools and specialist provisions have access to level one Team Teach training. So I have gone back to try and look to see is there opportunity for access to further tiers of team teach training and I've asked the team teach people themselves to come back and tell me whether that's appropriate or not so that's as much information as I have right now and I only got that response last night from okay. team teach. Well I have a response from that's maybe just a few days ago mm -hmm. to just, to, that contradicts that that they're, they're not able to get the team teach um, training that there's a development something in in the pipeline that's been level developed. one team mm -hmm. teach mm -hmm. as opposed to the higher tier mm -hmm. which is about um you know, restrictive practices about ground holds and things yeah. but they get the level one team teach training i've had that confirmed okay well I'll, I'll maybe go back again and just question that um if that's the case because as far as this school is concerned they're not they're not they've been told to go to the special school um, that's up the road and ask them to train them. So they have a t they may have a team teach tutor in the special school and that's where it would come from because team teach is a, a, there's a there's a team teach tutor who then trains on yeah, to no, others. Yeah, that's, so that's not the case. They just okay. have been trained in team teach. Could you maybe write to me separately yeah. about that, yeah, Cathy? Because I'd like to know what school it is so that I can contact them directly, if okay. that's okay. Thank you. In terms of a thousand places versus a thousand children, so a thousand places is based on the presumptions, so there's assumptions built in every year um, based on the projections that we've got, and that's based on an assumption. So it's not relating to individual children. Um, that's based on the assumption and actually the tendency is to over assume as well um, but for that to break that down some of those a small amount of those places will be for P7 to year 8 more of those places will be in the early years so as I said earlier some of those children we don't know coming through into nursery but some of those children will be nursery moving into P1 um, so it's based on an assumption of places that are required as opposed to here's a child that requires a place here um, as I said, and I'm sorry to keep going back to process, but I really do need to outline that. If a child started nursery last September with no statement, right, and a need has been identified in the nursery, that child may or may not then enter the 26-week statementing process. The child may or may not get a statement before the end of June. Bear in mind, we're now in April. 
If the child has a statement now, that statement then will be looking at their nursery placement, Mm -hmm. not their P1 placement, Mm -hmm. and will need to be reviewed to determine their P1 placement. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's why that mapping ahead can be very difficult because is it fair to review a child within a week of a statement? You know, so that's something we're looking at in terms of that statement and process to make that better. You know, if a child has a statement in nursery, it should be looking at the P1. Can I, can I just ahead. come in there? I mean, so I mean, we're talking in a scenario. Say a child's getting a statement in April okay. for their nursery placement, which they're in now. They're in. The, they're in the placement. That, that statement, they're, they're, they they have to wait for a formal review to then look at September, which could be weeks, months down the line. Currently stands that, that statement that, has to undergo an annual that, review. That surely so. has to be. And that's something that, that we're looking at in terms of that seems absolutely, like a really, really yes, simple at that mechanism to build flexibility yeah. in because that child's needs aren't going to change in the six weeks no. <laughs> between now and the end of term yeah. or nine weeks or whatever that's, it is. You that's know. what the process yeah. currently yeah. is and that's what we're examining yeah. under that process which is why the end-to-end review is actually vital here because if we don't get in under the process and start to streamline that, likewise there'll be children whose needs have not been identified until now. Um, is it the right thing to do to put them straight into statementing or is it better to access stage to support services or is it better that that the child's needs are met in the classroom Um, for those children coming into nursery that already have a statement is it fair to review that statement within weeks of them being in a preschool environment instead of giving the child the opportunity to be in the preschool environment and to give them that opportunity to enjoy that play-based learning activity-based learning and then see where their needs are at six months eight months down the line before their statement is reviewed Apologies for cutting in. Please feel Sorry. free to, to, to finish the, the, um, the, 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 ge- the geographical areas then, um, I know I wrote that down, um, is there work being done in those areas? So yes, the EA wrote to all schools on the 12th of February. <clears throat> those individual, did I say 291 schools that were contacted, so they are in those geographical areas of, play, of pressure and the solutions that are working their way through, Lorraine, and giving you those figures in terms of the solutions that are working their way through. So for the most part, there are solutions identified for quite a lot of those pressured areas, and we still need to work to identify more solutions in those areas. But that works. That, that's the latest information I have, which was back in February. February. Mm-hmm. So that will have moved again um, recently. So there will have been more solutions identified, and EA can certainly update you on that when they come. Not more work actually. is that just going back and communicating with schools again, or asking schools again? Contacting more schools yeah. in those areas. They're being contacted individually. Okay. Come on up. Sorry, can I just on the Downpatrick area, you mentioned that specifically. There's there's four schools identified within Downpatrick where there's agreed solutions for at this point. Just on the early, the early years, years yeah. piece, okay. So, yeah, thank you for reminding me. Um, so, we have also that work stream um, on early intervention and the early years piece. And I mean, I, I, Lorraine, do you want to talk about the work that you've been doing in your yeah. work stream? So, the early intervention work stream includes early intervention in the early years, but it's not, um, it doesn't, it also includes school age children, early intervention at the earliest point, I suppose. Um, We've done a bit of work on that. We're currently in the stakeholder engagement phase. We're engaging with early years practitioners, sure starts, nursery skills pre- and preschool settings with health colleagues. That's really important in this space. Um, uh, with the voluntary community sector and, and with parents. Um, and I suppose just to, we're also looking at good practice in other jurisdictions. And I'm linking in with the, the my counterparts uh, within the early early years directorate within the department to make sure that that what the solutions we're coming up with <coughs> are aligned with the early learning and child care strategy um, some of the early themes that are emerging and um, that we're working on um, proposals are about and none of this is really new early identification and assessment of need and that really needs to bring in our health colleagues to make sure that children are accessing the health visiting reviews that the data is being shared um, and also that um, where children are identified as needing early intervention by way of access to speech and language therapy and, and the other allied health professions, um, that they can get those at an early stage. Um, uh, we're looking at um, the offer within the preschool education programme and, and some of the things we're hearing from Uh, preschool education settings is around the need for better training um, and also um, to look at the staff child ratio um, as the profile of the children change and that's particularly challenging I suppose for nursery 
such a niche <coughs> settings where the, the staffing ratio is two to 26 children, which becomes very challenging if you've got a number of children in there that need additional support. And mm-hmm. um, also looking at options for developing a programme jointly with health for two year olds with um, additional needs or emerging additional needs and um, looking at what we can do in the space of parents to support them, to support their children at home. Mm-hmm. So it's all emerging um, and we'll be testing those solutions um, with the stakeholders um, as, as we go along. Okay, thanks, Chair. Thank you. Um, thank you for your time. I wanted to finish with one final question because we have talked a lot about immediate pressures um, and, and I understand that there was a lot of material in your briefing around the end-to-end review and that clearly the long-term transformation is really important here and I, and I think it's important that as a committee we, we recognise that and that we, we, have, you know, we want to, uh, to be involved in supporting in that work. C- could I just ask in terms of that long-term piece, when, when will there be an action plan and when will we have, have timings associated with that with cl- clear actions arising out of the, the end-to-end review? There's a few things that I need to point out. Each of the each of the twelve work streams are up and running, and in fact, some of them, you know, the early the clarification of of policy and legislative intent, you know, things like that are done. The outcomes framework is well underway, um, and the rest, as you've heard, you know, early years, all of those other work streams are underway at the minute. We're in the engagement phase. There's lots of good work, and I'm very glad about that. When yeah, will we get that you, all? Thank you, because we're working really in, hard on in this. A, in a form of this is this is what's happening and these are the timings and the actions so that yeah. we can okay see well in terms of there's no jam today is the first thing I would say about that so we have to get in underneath <coughs> all of those things and I'm, I'm sure each of you will understand the complexities involved with all of the processes around special educational needs um, so we're in that engagement phase at the moment um, following that we already have early actions that are starting to emerge so we have together a year one action plan that we think are the early actions that we could bring forward based on deliverability that's going to require significant investment Um, all of this is being done with no additional investment from the executive and in fact the last number of years we've been operating in a reduced budget with an increasing number of children which everyone knows about with an increasing number of children coming through with a multiplicity of need that you've already mentioned Robbie and no additional investment um, we've had to do it in a reduced budget environment. We've had no additional capital monies. And you've heard my colleague Suzanne Kingan was here telling exactly the same thing. Likewise, we've had no additional resource monies. We've had no additional money for staffing, for training. And I'm talking about our educational staff working in our classrooms, not, not, not ourselves in the department. We've had no additional money for any of this. So transformation, we are literally trying to fly a plane and remodel the plane at the same time. You've heard about the increased expenditure that we've had, 544 million to support children with special educational needs to stand still. In order to transform that system, we estimate we will need around 70 million resource expenditure this year to transform those early year one actions and that's all of that early intervention piece, all of that CPD, all of that, um, in order to truly transform the system properly and quickly we need 70 million resource, we'll need 70 million capital. Um, in the longer term, I won't put those figures out there just yet, you can read the independent review of education and it'll give you a ready reckoner as to what might be needed. But in the, So the year one action plan, I would hope we would be coming with that quite soon, but it will be, it'll be absolutely dependent on resource coming from the executive. And I look forward to committee support across all of the parties on that Um, but um, in the longer term following this engagement piece and bearing in mind I will need to get to a point where I need to pull everyone in on the same placements piece so I will have to set things aside in order to focus on same placements Um, and I will make that decision in the next week or two subject to ministerial approval Um, after that engagement piece that we're doing and aside from that year one action plan the longer term action plan will be developed when the engagement piece is done and I'm and I'm not going to um, I'm not going to consolidate the engagement piece because I think that's really important we have so many people we need to engage with and it's not about hearing their views it's not about listing the issues we know what the issues are they're well documented and we talk to parents and schools and children all the time it's about the solutions 
we can't sit in a darkened room and come up with solutions for saying nobody can. If we do that, it'll be words on a page, but it won't deliver and it definitely won't deliver on outcomes for children and young people. So the engagement phase is focusing on solutions that people can buy into, that they understand and that will work following that. I'm reliably informed that we will have an action plan and then that implementation phase will start then. Phase four will be that implementation plan. So I can't be really prescriptive because right now the focus is on same placements for us. And it's been very clear from the focus of the committee today, we, we are mindful of the, of, the, of the challenge in that space. I think it had been suggested that an action plan would be available by the summertime, so I just would be concerned that there'd be a lot of slippage. We will do our best to deliver as best we can, but as I say, having an action plan will put words on a page, Chair, but if we don't have the resource to follow that, then it is just words on a page. Are there no target dates at all, Janice? We're aiming for, we're aiming for the end for summertime. For that, mm. for that action plan. But at the minute, we, as I say, we know what that year one transformation plan will look like, but it's dependent on resources. But aiming for something and having a target date are two different things. I mean, do you have a target date? Tell us what the target date is. I can't put a target date on that, Pat, because at the minute there are so many different work streams in mm. train and other things are having to be pushed mm. back in order to focus on more pressing issues, of which same placements is one. So if we're to focus on same placements and get that right for September 24, and I've already talked about the crucial window that we have now for the operational plan in terms of area planning, that needs to be focused on. Otherwise, if I prioritise a target date to give words on a page in terms of an action plan and miss the window of actually getting in on the operational plan and the long-term plan for same placements, we'll be back next year. So I have to focus on what needs our priority right now. As I said at the very start, I have a very small team and I need to make sure that my resources are deployed because I don't have any additional resources. So, so I need to make sure they're deployed So effectively you're telling us you haven't enough resources to deal with same placements this year and consider the implementation plan at the same time? I am saying? considering the implementation plan and we currently are doing that but I may need to pause on some of the engagement in the work streams or some of the action planning in the work streams in order to pull staff in on same placements. I haven't made that decision yet but I will do subject to ministerial approval. But we are aiming for the summer that was always the aim, and we will continue our, to do our very best to meet that aim. I just bring. I, th I think this is important because the, the, the transformation bit is, is really crucial. So, Robbie, you were wanting to ask. Yeah, it, and, well, it's 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 not. It's basically on that point where we've had teachers and it, principals in particular um, saying it's it's no good contacting them in July or August, and when they don't have their, and I suppose that's one of the reasons why it needs to be. You need that resource, but. In terms of it, it goes back, and it's unfair to do this, but in the, the there's been a reduction in, yeah, it's, 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 it's to do with Pat's point, but in terms of the resourcing of your, your offices, because I think EA and, are in the same position because of the Senko, the, the, the reduction in the money for Senkos, so if half of the resource, half the money in for Senkos, is, is there going to be a longer term impact, do you think, if we don't resource the department or EA to fulfil the functions or the findings in the end end review when it comes out? No doubt. Absolutely. I mean, okay. you know... If everyone is saying that saying is a priority, and I do think saying should be a priority, and I have thanked the committee for putting it up there as a priority, but saying that something's important and appropriately resourcing it are two different things, and we can have action plans, we can have targets, we can write all that down on a page. If it's not appropriately resourced, it can't be delivered. Thank you. David, uh, 30 seconds. Yes, yes, I think you're absolutely right. I think if one thing I've got quite tired of since we've got here as well is uh, people across the chamber all parties talking about priorities if we prioritize everything we're prioritizing nothing so sometimes when you say you're prioritizing something it means that other things do need to give a little uh, uh, that's just the, the fact if there's if we're going to talk about crisis and we're going to talk about emergencies and we're going to try and pump up the the need for things in certain areas I'm not saying that that's that's not maybe needed, but we need to recognise that that comes with its own consequences. And also in terms of the resource and the funding, Chair, I think it is fair to say that that's, that, that is a consequence of the underfunding of Northern Ireland centrally, and I think that does need to be addressed as well, because transformation, it was the same for health, that the, the British government, in trying to get this place back up and running, were very keen to talk about all of the things that could be done whenever Storm was up and running. And a lot of it was around transformation of health and of education, 
Well, we know the transformation costs over and above the basic running of, of services as we have them now. So if you want to see transformation in more efficient services that cost less in the future, you need to invest <laughs> up front now. Thanks, Chair. Yep. We're all agreed. We're underfunded. Uh, and mm. more resources would help us all. Thank you very much for your, your you time guys. today. Thank, Thank you. you. Would members like a quick comfort break and then we'll bring the EA in? And get through the rest of the agenda. If we're ready to go, I can we can we can move yeah, straight in. Do do. Okay, well, we'll do we'll do that. If we can save five, five minutes. Five okay, minutes. probably. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> out of my nose. Yeah, sorry about that. Committee room twenty nine. Sound. On what um, you had answered and what you want to uh, go back on in uh, in writing, members. So, on the strategic point, um, the question of what quantum. Of, of money has been used to address systemic issues as opposed to keeping steady state. <coughs> um, I think it might be worth uh, putting in writing. Um, and why cultivate separately the approach by education and health um, and what the issues are there with data in particular? Um, those are the two main things that I took out. Um, Chair, I'm still completely confused by the thousand places and thousand children because when the minister came last, he d described it as a thousand children. So this assumption of a thousand places, I don't know how many children that's, this is. I think if we could just get think, written clarity. I think we could seek clarity. I think my understanding is that, that the thousand is an assumption uh, rather than, than, than specifically identified children. But I think we're into splitting hairs here. Well, exactly. Yeah. It feels yeah. like it's deliberately to muddy the waters. I think we are splitting hairs. Yeah. But I think seeking clarity of that in that writing. The, the point was, as I said, a thousand out of seven thousand is nineteen percent, which is the which is what the figure is, and, and what for what difficulty does that create? It's, an unknown. it's, yeah. it's not. It's a known known. So there, the other thing is maybe not for you guys, but I'm def, definitely intrigued about this presumption for mainstreams thing. I'm not sure that is a good starting point for, in the best interest of a child. I understand the inclusive. Nobody more <laughs> interested in inclusion. However, what is in the best interest of a child? And I think the in terms of the end to end review that development of an inclusive education policy mm -hmm. remains in action but w when we see that delivered where some of those things will be clarified we'll, we'll again we're we're short on on time scales for some of those but i think roy mentions well from from parents and so on that you engage with on the constituency level there's a difference of opinion on what they think they and very strong opinions on where they think that their child should be so it's not 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 easy to chart that it's chart not. as well as either no okay. uh, those actions are happy to just, just want to labour on this issue of health involvement in the local integrated teams. Wonder have have we had any communication with with health around that? If not, could we write to the minister? Yeah, that, that would be. We certainly could. Yeah. I mean, I think we did um, consider that there were a couple of issues that we might want to do a concurrent meeting with health on as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, restraint and seclusion being one, and this area. Um, or the early intervention. Yeah. yeah. Early the, yeah. I, I I think it's actually quite a, a simple concept <coughs> you know if, if, if we go by the model that the department have been talking about that rather than having six classroom assistants in a class what they'll do is have a separate class with maybe one teacher and a couple of assistants and then as they need expert support and speech and language behavioral therapy and so on and so forth they'll bring it in so there won't be a, a a multidisciplinary team in a school but there will be a multidisciplinary team in an area and so the speech therapist will be in on a Monday the behavioural therapist on a Tuesday and you have the team let, let's just take like a constituency like West Belfast where a large number of schools and we'll have X number of behavioural therapists speech and language therapists and so on I mean it, it, it seems to me not something very difficult to organise <laughs> I understand the difficulty that health don't seem to have bought into it yet. If, if you know, if that's if if we can believe what we're hearing for some reason, uh, health health uh, don't seem to be too positive about it. But I mean, they I seem to be what, making what, something complex out of something that, that to me appears quite simple. What we've got, I think, with local integrated teams, and again, it can be hard to unpick, is just yeah. a slightly modified way of accessing support through the EA. 
and that doesn't that doesn't yeah. feel multidisciplinary to me at all. No. Um, no. So no. I, th- no. I think that we, we maybe do need to there's maybe a piece of correspondence for, for health uh, around their engagement uh, on multidisciplinary. Do we teams. have do we have plans for? I know we discussed it, but do we have plans for a joint committee meeting with health? I know we do have for economy, but is no, there not formally? But should we factor that no. in? I, I, think, yeah. I think I think that's something that really would be best stressed in that so, forum. Yeah, I think yeah. that's <coughs> either, either if we don't have time today, but I think at our strategic session, which has been factored in, we we can maybe try and really we get that nailed down in terms of what we'd want to cover and that but I think that is something we should be exploring yeah. I think Kate and I would both ask a child course on that agenda yeah. as well yeah. it all fit, it all, it's all in the early yes, intervention okay, yeah. Yes, yeah. So. okay uh, Robbie you're, you're excused okay. <laughs> all right, so we'll just go into we close for the comfort the committee room 29 sound Mitty Room 29, sound. Committee 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 Room 29, sound.
Committee Room 29, signed. 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 Committee Room 29, signed.
Committee Room 29, Sound. 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 Committee Room... Bring the officials in, yeah. Okay, so just refer members to the briefing paper from the committee clerk at page 22 and the briefing paper from the EA at page 25, uh, and that also included correspondence <coughs> from the Minister of Education regarding the secondment of uh, Richard Pengelly to the post of uh, Chief Executive Officer at the EA, and that's on page 44. Please swap them around, is that okay? Uh, yes, if you want, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. 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 Sorry, Chair. <laughs> You're okay, just let you all get settled. <laughs> Okay, good afternoon. So while, while you're all uh, getting uh, settled, uh, you're very welcome here at the Education Committee this afternoon. Um, and we're, we're looking forward to, to hearing uh, your, your first day briefing uh, today. So I just want to begin by welcoming each of you individual, uh, individually. Uh, today we have uh, Dale Hanna, uh, Director of Children and Young People's Services. Uh, Cynthia Curry, <coughs> Director of Education. Uh, Robbie McGreevy, Interim Director of HR and Corporate Services. Donna Allen, Interim Director of Operations and Estates, and also Ivor Johnson, the Temporary Director of Finance. So you are all very welcome uh, here, and, and thank you for, for giving up your time uh, to, to present to committee. Um, we would be asking for an, an opening presentation of up to 10 minutes. Um, I emphasise up to 10 minutes, um, and then we'll move to, to question and answer after that. So okay. It's over to you. Okay, Chair. Thank you. Look, you, you, you you've done the introductions. Well, I would just say on behalf of Ivor, Ivor's only just joined us on Monday, so he is he is very very new <laughs> in his role as <laughs> as temporary. <laughs> um, <laughs> straight into questions. Ivor's got it. We want to know. <laughs> and, um, and, and look, obviously, we know we have our new chief executive, um, Richard Pengelly, who's been seconded from the civil service and um, is taken formally up post on the fifteenth of April, and no doubt at, at a future point you'll, 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 he will be able to attend. So look, just to go straight in, you'll be aware that EA is a non-departmental body sponsored by the Department of Education. It's the largest single employing authority in Northern Ireland with over 44,000 staff. Um, we're responsible for the delivery of efficient, equitable education, support and youth services across Northern Ireland to meet the needs of children and young people. Um, you'll understand the education landscape in Northern Ireland is complex and multi-layered, and as a result, the EA has different statutory duties depending on the type of school. In all of its work, the EA is accountable to the EA Board, who ensures that all policies and actions support the Executive's programme for government and the strategic policies of the Minister of Education and are conducted with appropriate governance, regularity, probity and deliver value for money. Before I touch on some of the key priority areas, it's important to look back to the genesis of the Education Authority, which is very relevant to the many challenges we continue to face. The establishment of EA, or the establishment of the Education and Skills Authority, which was never formed, spanned a 10-year period, during which time the necessary improvement and investment to remain aligned with other public sector organisations was significantly reduced. 
Therefore, when EA was established and became operational on the 1st of April 2015, the immediate priority was critical business need to maintain service delivery. This resulted in gaps in culture, process, <coughs> policy and strategy. However, from 2019, the EA has been on a journey of transformation, and despite the many challenges we face, a number of significant improvements have been made. I would want to stress at the heart of everything we strive to do are children and young people, the wider school communities and our staff. This is evidenced in our work to support children and the wider education system throughout COVID, our absolute commitment to improve the experiences of children with special education needs, and our support for newcomer children and in the significant work undertaken to develop new digital services to support young people, parents and carers and schools. We have developed a people plan, which we'll be launching in the next few weeks, to begin our journey towards being an organisation that all of our people feel proud to work for, and where they feel valued and supported and can see the impact they make. We've also set up a people-focused HR programme to ensure we deliver high-quality, impactful services and support to schools and staff in line with best practice. And from a broader organisational point of view, as a result of robust strategic and financial management, despite all the financial pressures, we have managed to break even. Whilst we have made much progress across a range of areas, we do recognise that there is much more to be done, and we are very ambitious about the further change which needs to take place. Both the landscape review of EA and the independent review of education provide a firm foundation for moving forward and will play an important part in how we can collectively and collaboratively develop a modern and responsive education system. In particular, there is significant work underway in relation to the implementation of a joint DE-EA um, landscape review action plan. There is a genuine desire to continue to transform services in the best interests of children. However, the reality is there is nowhere near enough funding to support all aspects of the education sector in Northern Ireland. Education has been underfunded for more than a decade and the budget continues to reduce further in real terms. It is estimated that a recurrent funding gap of over £350 million <coughs> will arise in the current financial year. And this is before the recurrent cost of the teachers', the teachers pay settlement, the cost of the pay and grading review, and costs for any other pay award settlements are taken into consideration. In addition, the EA is anticipating a significant capital funding gap, which could be in excess of £100 million. This gap assumes that EA will largely only incur expenditure on contractual and inescapable expenditure. The EA has made some significant efforts to make savings and efficiencies, through our savings and sustainability programme. However, the vast majority of funding received is used almost exclusively to provide funding to schools and to deliver services that support schools and children. And most of those services are statutory services, so we must provide those services. This means there is extremely limited scope to reduce services further without impacting directly on schools and ultimately on children and young people. It is therefore vital there is sustained investment in education and in the innovation and transformation of services. Looking to the year ahead, one of EA's most critical priorities is ensuring that all children and young people with uh, special education needs get the right support from the right people, at the right time and in the right place. Over the past 12 months, the Department of Education, in collaboration with ourselves, have undertaken an end-to-end -end review of special education needs, and this has identified several priority areas which can be progressed at pace and used to inform long-term systemic change. A critical immediate priority is increasing the number of places in special schools and specialist provisions in mainstream schools. You will be aware that there has been a significant rise in the number of pupils with a statement over the last six years. For September 2024, we are currently planning on the basis that approximately 100 additional specialist classes across the region will be required. We are in discussions with nearly 170 schools regarding the establishment of additional classes, and we very much need the continued support from schools to deliver the required places. Quite simply, demand is outstripping supply. What we've been doing in partnership with schools and sectoral partners is utilising the existing school estate and working with the community, voluntary and private sector to create appropriate additional places for children with SEM. Since 2020, 480 specialist provisions in mainstream classes and over 190 schools have been set up, providing quality education experiences for pupils with special needs. 140 additional classes have also been established over the last three academic years in special schools, including eight dual campus sites, 
all of which are now operational. This extensive system-wide effort has ensured that we've been able to ensure that each year, despite unprecedented challenges and demand, the vast majority of children receive an appropriate place at the start of the new school year. However, we have been engaging and listening carefully to the stories and voices of parents and absolutely recognise the <coughs> uncertainty and anxiety that late placements and poor communication causes, and I'm sure we'll come on to that. We can talk about that in more detail. We will continue to do our utmost to create additional places, provide greater certainty for parents and improve communications with them. However, there are undoubtedly challenges and there is no doubt without sustained investment, continued transformation and systemic change in line with the end-to-end -end review of special education needs and the special education strategic area plan, real change will not be delivered. It is also critical that we invest in all of our staff, both teaching and support staff right across the sector, and we very much welcome that the five trade unions, which make up um, the Northern Ireland Teachers' Council, have accepted the three-year pay offer on behalf of their members. This was formally ratified on the 9th of April, and this settlement ends all industrial action by teachers and school leaders, which has been going on since May 2022. In relation to the pay and grading review for support staff, the Minister has outlined the business case approval has now been received from the Department of Finance to enable issues to be progressed with the current grading structure for support staff. Significant additional funding will be required to enable the preferred option to be implemented, and we under understand the Minister has submitted a bid for the required additional funding as part of the 24-25 budget round, and we, we really hope that that is going to be successful. However, we remain very concerned that um, that we, however, we remain very concerned that disruption to the education of our young people will continue as funding has not been identified to meet the cost of EAP and grading review, and the members of the support unions remain on action short of strike. The support unions have indicated that they will have no option other than to escalate if there isn't progress made on that um, business case. We don't underestimate the challenges facing EA and the wider sector, but look forward to continuing to work in partnership to build on the positive work to date now and in the future. Thank you, Chair. We're happy to take questions. Uh, thank you. Um, and and you'll, you'll be aware we had the department in uh, for our previous evidence session, and that was very much focused on, on, on SEN, and I would I'd be, be focusing my initial questions on that. I don't know what, what other areas my other members want to, uh, to, to cover. We, we do, and I, I used this phrase when we, we spoke with, with the <coughs> department, um, and there, there was a, a little bit of pushback around the phrase, but I would I would characterise where we are as, as in another year of crisis management uh, in terms of placements um, for SEN. Um, the department maybe didn't like that language, I don't think, w w when we raised it, but but I, I would characterise it as, as, as a crisis scenario. It does look that we are looking for SPIMs, the, the specialist provisions in mainstream, uh, as one part of the solution to manage that. What, what assurances can you give the committee and what assurances indeed can you give parents who are you know, waiting for placements for their children that those placements and those specialist provisions in mainstream will actually be the right support at the right time from the right people in the right place? Will they be appropriate placements or are they just what is needed to manage a crisis? Because I, I think we need to maintain our focus that there are children requiring and have not requiring of a right to an education. So will those placements and those specialist provision in, in mainstream units be the right and appropriate placements that meet their needs? So I, I, I think, Chair, the simple answer to that is yes, they will be the appropriate placement to meet the needs. And at some point in this answer, I'm going to ask Cynthia to speak a little bit about what those placements look like. So in, in terms of the, the analysis of crisis management, we're certainly in a very challenging and complex environment in terms of what we're <coughs> trying to achieve in terms of the um, getting the right places for, for children and young people. I mean, last year it was an unprecedented position in terms of we had a reasonable planning assumption that there would be an increase of 5 to 6% of children um, with special needs that, that needed a place. Actually, what uh, turned out was closer to four or five-fold that figure. Um, so that was very difficult last year in terms of trying to manage that and trying to put in place the appropriate arrangements for those children and young people in terms of the places across the system. Um, we, we've spent a considerable amount of time this year revisiting our planning assumptions around that and we know that the number you know, in additional places for about 1,000 children has been um, um, used. That, that is sort of the figure that we're looking at. We think that it's going to be... An additional thousand places. There's an additional thousand children that need to be placed 
um, this year, predominantly in early years in, in primary school settings, but also across all the other um, transition points. So we've been working to that thus far. We've had different milestones, <coughs> and our assumptions seem to be that that is the case. Thankfully, it doesn't appear to be increasing, so the number of new referrals appears to be levelling off. So I think that that's a positive sign for the future in terms of... Um, in, terms of the, in terms of those spins, in, uh, if, you, if I was a parent and I was advised that my, my child had a placement in, in a spin, will there be the workforce that required with the specialist skills, training, experience? <coughs> will there be the wraparound support going in to, to meet those children? Can you describe what, it looks, what, what that's going to look like? Because... I'm not aware if there's been any sort of analysis done of, of how those spims have operated in the previous year that were that were established at pace for September 23. If we don't have that evidence base, how do we know that what we're putting in place this year is actually going to be effective? And I would, really would want to, to draw it on the workforce issue. We you know we had an informal briefing uh, just yesterday with uh, the, the trade some of the trade union uh, representatives, and they were very concerned around uh, the, the availability of workforce and actually whether or not. It's an attractive option um, to, to go into to this uh, kind of work as a classroom assistant, given the terms and conditions. Uh, and also, are, are there enough teachers to, to, with, the, with the necessary skills to staff the, the, these new new classes? So you probably I'll not, pick up on yeah. the support. And then we can pick up on the workforce. <coughs> I suppose one of the things, uh, Chair, that, that we need to remind ourselves of is that SPIM is if you like, it's a new acronym, it's a new term, but um, units, as they were called, or learning support centres, have been here for many, many years with some excellent examples of children that have gone through the system and been part of that. I know certainly... Just, are not, not, not set up at the pace at which they are being... Not, I was about to say and, that, Chair. So, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, certainly <laughs> in the school that I was principal of, we had a lot of experience of this and a lot of experience in terms of integrating children to the main stream it was a post-primary school um, but what I can say then in setting up we have set up alongside setting up the specialist provisions the specialist setting support team so we have a, a multi-service team links in uh, very um, clearly with our settings there is a link uh, person in that team that links links to each of the spims and then within each of those um, settings they look they look at a skills analysis for the staff that are in the setting um, they look at the profile of children within the setting. They help the school in how they may set up their room and uh, some of the practical day-to-day -day modelling of what support will uh, look like. And that particular model has got um, lots of positive feedback and indeed is also gathering evidence of what is the baseline <coughs> when a school starts with a SPIM, you know, how are children progressing through that, how do staff feel their confidence is growing after uh, working with the team. So we've had that information for the last couple of years as that team um, has grown uh, more and more. Um, I suppose what we would seek to do is try to grow that model even more because the new provisions that are being set up are getting that really intense support, often on the ground, boots on the ground, staff out helping and modelling. Um, but there are provisions that have been set up for a number of years that are looking at children with complex needs and do require more support. And it's that element that we're moving into to try to grow the model that we currently do have. But look, I, I can assure, Chair, that there is a lot of work in this space, a lot of professional development in this space um, in coming from that particular team. Um, and they have both universal targeted bespoke programs and also they um, have cluster work across schools so that they can learn from practice across each of the schools. So there's certainly a lot of positive feedback from that particular team and the schools that they work with. Also in addition to that, that that's looking I suppose at the educational piece but there is the practical setup so we have cross directorate teams within the education authority <coughs> working on placements, so whether that's operations and estates in terms of the uh, accommodation or resourcing, and those teams uh, come together um, to support the school at the early stages of development. I, th I think, Chair, in terms of Cynthia's comments about supporting the schools, I think what's really important is we, we have a model there to support that, but that needs to be resourced. Now, the department have asked us, um, and again, I'm going to quote this figure off the top of my head, I think the figure is sort of circa 23 million. So, yes, we are operating the pace, setting up all of those additional um, SPIMs and, and, and other capacity, and we do, we want to, and we need to support those schools 
so that they can provide the right education for children and young people, but that needs to be resourced. In terms of the work for, workforce piece, that is, that is absolutely challenging, Chair. Um, and yes, we're, we're currently looking to see how we can support the system, particularly around the likes of classroom assistance. Can we do some sort of like mass um, recruitment process? But again, the pay and grading issues are, are an issue for, for people coming into the um, into the sector. And again, w with the teachers, again, it's difficult in the sense that individual schools are responsible for their own recruitment. So until we know that a SPIM or a provision has been set up in a particular school, then we, we, we can't do anything in advance of that. Um, but certainly we all of our teams, the recruitment teams internally, this is our absolute um, number one priority organisationally and all of our teams, whatever they're involved in, are pivoting towards supporting whatever is needed both internally and both within the broader system. I mean, I think certainly from, from, from what we heard from the trade unions, there seems to be a, a concern among even a lot of classroom <laughs> assistants that they, they don't always access the training that they, that, that they feel they need to, to meet the level of complexity of need. So I, I think it is absolutely <coughs> critical that anybody coming in to, to staff one of these spins is properly trained um, to, to deal with that level of complexity. The members will want to come in. I just want to ask one other question. I think every I think everybody in this room, um, who, you know, in their constituency office, will have dealt with parents in a state of distress at some point leading up to September of last year uh, with, 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 the, with the issue around placements. And one of the things that was fed back mm. to me, and I think this will be echoed by everybody, was that they felt the communications between parents and EA were very poor. And, and I'm choosing my words carefully. Uh, I think that's being kind. I think at times it, it was non-existent mm. uh, is the phrase that, that was used, that they could not access a link officer. They just could not get someone to pick up the phone. Um, and that from the beginning of a statement, I have a family who described statementing process began and they didn't hear from anybody until they were being offered a placement. And that cannot be acceptable in terms of the link officer contact. What, what, what plans have you got in place to ensure that that is not reflected this year? We appreciate the context is difficult, but one thing surely that we can get right is the communications with parents who who really, in some cases, they just want to hear, even if there's no news, just to hear that somebody is still aware of their child um, in, in this process. So, Chair, look, that was definitely something that we heard um, very loud and clear last year, and we also met with parents, and it was obvious that there was a lot of distressed parents and they felt they couldn't get through the link officer. So just to provide some assurance, what we're currently developing is a model. So we're working on an assumption that it is going to be difficult and challenging to place all children before the 1st of September and that there will be, when we get to the 30th of June, a number of pupils and families that have yet to have their place um, confirmed. And what we're going to do, and I'm going to use the, use the phrase wraparound or hypercare, what we're going to do is identify that particular cohort of families um, and we're going to put in a, an enhanced form of support where they will have a nominated person who will be like a, a super link officer. And that individual will be committed to those number of families that they'll have. They'll work with a much smaller number of families than a link officer would normally work with. And they will support that family throughout that period of the summer until we, we get their place established. And hopefully that will be before the end of the summer, but also work with that family should there be an eventuality that we're unable to get a place before the 1st of September. So, we're currently working on what that would look like. Um, that will mean diverting internal resource from other priorities and other service delivery areas to do that. So look, Chair, we, we've really heard that message that we need to support those families. So we're going to put in a, a wraparound <coughs> hypercare system. I don't like that phrase, hypercare. But what we're going to do is put in a dedicated team to support those families that find themselves in that position. And hopefully that will address... Um, we're confident that that will address uh, the issue of communication for those families that find themselves in that position. And I would just emphasize, and obviously, if a, if a child isn't placed, they'll, they'll need that, that input, yeah. but, but parents need the communication now as well, because they're, they're, the system is live for them yeah. now, and, and, and the concern around placements is live now, so we, we, would, we would be keen to see comms at the highest, best possible level for, from, from now. Um, look, there'll be lots of other uh, members wanting to come in. I'll bring the deputy chair in. So, uh, asking for for question and answers to, to take seven minutes. So, make sure answers are are, are direct and, and to the point, okay. so we can we can get to the to the to the query. Thanks, chair. Deputy chair. Um, Dale, currently, you have three interim directors, one temporary director. 
You have a new Chief Executive coming in. I'm not sure what title is he going to have. Is he interim or is he permanent or temporary? Or? Um, our new Chief Executive is the interim Chief Executive. Okay. Well, all those interims and temporaries in any organisation would suggest a level of instability within the organisation. And the EA has taken a hammer over the last number of years around the same issue and, and particularly uh, the placements every year. And I'm, I'm not necessarily blaming the EA for all the problems that exist. The department needs to uh, take its responsibility as well. But um, I have, you know, Nick mentioned the whole issue of all this trying to be sorted out at pace, you know, we writing out all the schools, we need you to take a uh, set up a, a new uh, provision for, for special needs within your school and so on. And some of the stories we're hearing are, are quite horrendous that uh, <coughs> some children aren't getting the places that they need and require, and the learning of some children is being disrupted by other children being put into that an environment where they shouldn't be. So. I mean, I've spoken to parents who, with children with very complex needs, uh, physical uh, uh, physical needs in particular, and have been placed in an environment with children who simply have behavioural issues, and the two don't seem to go together. I mean, it's like oil and water, uh, putting the two together. So I'm just flagging up some of those issues, but... In terms of the uh, the audit report that was carried out a few years ago about uh, the value for money and the EA and the department couldn't show that there was value for money despite hundreds of millions and now I mean over 50% of the black grant is going on special needs. So have, have there been any improvements and if there have can you explain where they are? Okay, so I suppose just firstly what I want to comment on the leadership piece, I think that although we are an interim team, we're all experienced leaders, um, we've been around a few blocks, um, so look, I was just want to provide some assurances around that, we're absolutely committed mm -hmm. to being, you know, we're part of the corporate leadership team, and whilst we're not interim, and to use the football analogy, whilst we might, some of us might be subs, we're on the pitch and we're playing for Manchester United, so we're on we're on the pitch and we're there to do a job. So I just want I just want to provide some assurances around that. Um, in in terms of the the, the, the again you're making the point about children in, in classes with um, um, with with their their peers. Um, I don't know, Cynthia, are you able to no, pick up on that? I suppose just um, in terms of the specialist provision, specialist set and support team will work with the staff. And if there are issues like that that are identified where there's a group of children that doesn't seem to gel together and, and there have been different needs that emerge and of course children's needs change over time even after being placed within a setting. So our teams internally, um, both Dale's team and, and the specialist support team in my directorate would then be seeking to try to address that or to support the staff in um, helping the children who are in those particular um, uh, particular uh, positions. Yeah, but uh, pardon me for interrupting you. But why would you need a specialist team to tell you that putting children with behavioural difficulties, with no uh, physical issues, in a classroom with children with severe physical difficulties? Why would you need a specialist team to tell you that's not a good idea? No, I don't think you wouldn't need a specialist team. You would know that quite clearly. And another one is children with autism, for example, who have sensory needs. Um, but what I'm what I'm saying is that for some the children their their needs do change. Um, for example, if we take children in the early years or in primary one where their needs manifest themselves more um, evidently, then you have children with behavioural needs, and those behaviours may become uh, more evident than when um, the children were placed um, in, in the first place. I know certainly that the statutory assessment team uh, in uh, Dale's um, directorate will also look at the profile of the class when they're placing a child. So they look at the child's needs, but they do look at work with the profile of need um, on that as well. But there are times that you find that you do need to make a change of placement along the way. Yeah, and 
I mean, I, I understand, given that you're trying to establish these, this provision at pace, that sometimes it is going to be difficult to make sure everything, uh, everything works in the way it's supposed to. But the department are promoting, and I'm not sure whether the EA uh, have been collaborating on this, talking about a new model <coughs> in terms of the special provision in mainstream, that rather than having four or five, six classroom assistants in a, in a mainstream class, which in itself could be disruptive, that uh, those children would be moved out into another classroom, maybe with one teacher, a couple of <coughs> classroom assistants, and then, as it's needed, specialist provision would be brought in, speech and learn and behavioural therapy, and so on and so forth. But we're here, and just uh, has EA been involved in collaboration around that model with the department? I mean, uh, uh, in terms of, of the end end review, then the one of the strands is classroom assistant um, model in terms of deployment. I um, suppose I need to say at the outset, obviously, I mean, we have a work a significant workforce of classroom assistants. There's about fifteen thousand across Northern Ireland, and you know. They're dedicated to children and young people, but yes, as part as part of the end to end review, um, the, there is going to be um, work to look at what <coughs> alternative models might be available to schools and settings, which may the, deviate from the classroom yeah, assistant I, I, approach. I suppose the, the point I want to get to is that, you know, if that model is going to be established, it will need the support of parents, because if a statement says a child needs one to one support. Parents are going to be reluctant mm. to give that up unless they can be convinced that the, the equivalent support or better support is going to be available. And we're here now. Well, first of all, we heard that the, the, the multidisciplinary team's name has been changed to local integrated teams. Uh, and we're also hearing now that health hasn't really bought into this yet. So there's going to be difficulty in terms of providing the necessary support from a health perspective. And, and, and the reason I'm asking you, and I'm not clear yet whether the EA have been involved in these discussions around this new model or not, but how is it going to work unless you can convince parents that children are going to get the support they need? <clears throat> so I think there's two things as well. So I think it's a brief and there's, a clar a there's an important clarification point there so that we, that we don't um, merge two issues. So, so in terms of the classroom assistant approach, classroom assistant at the minute is, 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 is normally provided where a child has a statement. Um, in terms of the local integrated teams, that's very much about, and, and Cynthia might talk a little bit later on about that, that's very much about the support, the graduated response to children before they would reach having a statement. So that's at stage one and stage two of the process. So the local integrated teams is very much about going in and supporting schools before a child ever gets to needing a formal statement. The piece about the classroom assistance is very much around the traditional approaches that, uh, that there would be a classroom assistant provided based on what was advised or in the advices of the education and psychologist, for example. So there are two different pieces of work. Um, and so it's important that we don't merge that. So we are working collaboratively with the department around what that classroom assistant piece might look like, and, and there's been early engagement on that. And then the other piece around the local integrated teams, which is about supporting schools, and about making sure that we get the right response into <coughs> the children at an early stage, because we talk about early intervention. The local integrated teams is all about early intervention, and providing that support long before, and hopefully the appropriate intervention before a child ever needs to get to the stage where they have a statement. Cheryl, you were next. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, so actually just following on from one of your points, um, communication is a massive issue, um, as, as the Chair has pointed out there, for parents in this situation. Um, one of the things I keep hearing is that the <coughs> lack of replies to emails or phone calls and voicemails and sickness and things like that. Um, in terms of staff, are staff still currently working from home within the department or are staff back in the building? Um, and then in terms of what departments are you working with. Um, I have another question just in terms of data. So data sets are a major issue throughout the whole um, government here. 
and it's something I think that we need to build on. So it's just to ask, has an assessment been carried out to investigate the school estate and what is readily available to address saying um, or is the contact only made with schools in the light of a situation in a, in a high demand area? So, Do you want me to go on about the school estate? Yeah, you take on about the school estate and then I'll come back in about the, um, about, about the home working. Yeah. Um, so, um, as part of the homework, and, and we'll pick up that point in more detail, but we are looking at all of our estates, absolutely. We have lots of estate, and a lot of our corporate estate would have been old schools. Um, so, as part of that capital um, strategy, we are absolutely looking at our school estates in terms of solutions for, for say, and placements. And, um, and we have a number of examples across where we have, you know, in Dundonald and the Lee and wherever, where we've actually got you know, special schools now in, in that estate. So I suppose in terms of reviewing our estate, absolutely the first priority is would it be suitable for staying accommodation? It is our highest priority in the organisation. Um, so that is absolutely taken into consideration. So we're not <coughs> looking at schools, but obviously the schools then have to obviously run the, the, yeah. the area and whatever. But in terms of actual physical accommodation, we're looking at our absolutely our corporate estate as well. And we're looking at other more out of the box, you know, we're looking at things like, you know, mobile classrooms, we're getting them from a from uh, County Kildare, we're bringing up mobile classrooms and, and putting them in other sites. So we look at every single potential option, nothing is ever ruled out. Um, and, and, and my team have been working really, really hard around that. Um, and the time periods are very condensed to what we would normally refurbish a classroom or um, build or put a modular building in. We've really, really condensed those time frames down considerably. And that is staff working, you know, flat out on that, and it is a priority for the organisation. So, just to give you that assurance, so. I think in terms of the schools, yeah. I think um, what I would say there is it's difficult to have a sense of it, sort of from a strategic piece, because I mean, take a school that might have ten classrooms. On paper, they might have seventy kids, and one might look at that and go, "Well, actually, theoretically, there should be three spare classrooms, and we should be able to put in a specialist <coughs> provision." Yeah. In reality, though. Each school's environment is different and how the senior le leadership team in each of those schools have developed how the, you know, their, their learning environment might mean that when we actually go to visit that school, there isn't the, the three spare classrooms. So I think that's perhaps um, important. So on paper, we might think there's spare capacity within a particular school building, but actually when we go to meet with the school, they have, I don't want to use spread out, but you know, they, they, they have utilised the space for um, the best intentions of the children and young people that are already in the school. So that communication, is that ongoing or is that has that been across Northern Ireland, Ireland then or is it just focused on those high demand areas at the moment or and how is that kind of communication done? So initially we uh, wrote to all schools um, and we are working with colleagues in the department to um, in, uh, send out another series of letters which will be much more focused and targeted to the areas that we know we have our, our pressure areas. In, in terms of the home working, what it would say is we, we, we operate like many modern organisations, a hybrid approach, but I'm happy to ask Abby just, uh, Robbie just to give a little bit more detail about our approach around that. Thank you. Yep, look, we, are, we have an agile working policy, um, just like most private sector and public sector organisations now do. Um, Post-COVID is not the same as, we're not going back to pre-COVID. Um, uh, and we're all competing in the same pool in terms of resources and recruitment and retention. Um, and so it is important that you have a policy on that and to be able to attract and retain staff. And, and we know that we have recruited staff who, would not, who have told us they would not have come to work for us if we didn't have an agile working policy in place. And, they, and, and it was actually they didn't come for the salary, but they came for the agile working approach because of where they lived. Um, maybe out in the West or whatever, and, and made it possible for them to apply for and take the job on. Now, what, what goes along with that is an assessment by every line manager. So an application has to be made for agile working, it has to be assessed by the manager, and it can be withdrawn at any time. And we monitor the performance against that. So we also have a customer excellence um, program in place to try to improve <coughs> and listen because we've listened to you know phones not being answered people not being contacted and so on so for our direct services um, that interact directly with parents mm -hmm. or with schools 
we monitor those now. So we know when calls are, we have the information that I haven't got with me today, but we have the numbers of calls answered um, when. There's some lessons to be learnt from that information, so we know at real peak times that we don't always have enough staff on to answer those calls, so that there's, work, there's work around that as well. We have um, good feedback systems <coughs> in place for school leaders now in terms of the service that we're providing. Um, and what's coming through more in relation to that now is not so much that the calls aren't being answered, but when they get through, they maybe don't get through to the person that they need to speak to, to, to who can answer the query that they have. So we're doing some work in, in, in relation to that as well. So I suppose I would say, yes, we do have a, an agile working policy, but we do monitor the performance against that. I think, can I just I suppose just add to that? I think particularly from a special needs point, point of view, the number of children that have statements is about 20, 25 per cent, and that increases the volume of calls coming in. We haven't had, and this isn't about a, you know every time we say something, it's about additional resource, but the reality is our staff teams haven't increased. So across many of our services, our teams are really, really stretched. And I think some people have put two and two together and said, oh, you know, staff from EA are working from home and they're not answering the phones. That, that is not the case. Pe people are working really, really hard in the organisation. They are answering the phone, and I think, as, as Robbie has articulated, sometimes th there's a frustration because they haven't got the answer. If a parent phones up and says, I want to know where my child's going, and we're, we're saying, we don't know where your child's going because we haven't create, created this, this, the place yet, I can understand how, in that scenario, that parent is really, really frustrated and feels that we haven't answered their, their query properly. But in terms of actually answering the phone, I don't believe we've any organised, any, you know, any systemic organisational issue around that. Mm -hmm. No, I appreciate that, and I think it's just a point to say that I suppose for any parent in that situation, <coughs> sometimes the comfort of that reply, regardless of what that apply, you know, the, that reply is, you know, that that does give them some sense of warmth to know that somebody is listening to them. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the point. I, I do get with agile work, and there is a place for it. But in terms of communication, collaboration, and making sure you know human contact is is one of the main things that to get work driven there. So it's it's just a point and. It's good to hear it's being monitored. Draw this one to a close, Thank Cheryl. you, yes, yeah, I'm done. Yeah. So that, that, <laughs> I, I would just add to that that I think parents feel they are lost in the system sometimes when you don't get an answer. Mm -hmm. You feel like your your case has somehow been, been, been lost in that case as a child. So I think that's 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 yeah. the key mm -hmm. bit to, to remember. Kate? Uh, thank you, Chair. I actually would assume that the main reason why people aren't getting responses is because of the level of, of of sick leave and issues within the department and you know that I put questions in about the number of people who um, have been off and I think 3,042 days of out of one year for 138 people is something that's very concerning and I guess that is where I would go to the solution of the super link officer that concerns me because for me it seems like there's an organizational problem um, at, with so many people being off and I'm just worried that creating this new role isn't necessarily creating the issues that have resulted in so many people being off. So maybe that's something you can comment on. Um, but uh, there, were, there were kind of two two separate things that I wanted to, and I'll put them all together. Um, the business case for the non-teaching staff pay and grading review, um, who's to blame uh, for that? Um, I wanted to, to uh, ask if EA will continue funding non-EA nurseries like Mancap and Sandspace this year. Um, <coughs> St John Vianney in my constituency, a brilliant um, uh, youth club. Uh, I know they have asked to extend the deadline um, from the 12th of April to give the community breathing space to respond to that. Have you any update on that? And finally, um, you come under a lot of criticism, uh, but I just want to pay tribute to your intercultural team who are excellent. I do a lot of work with asylum seekers and refugees and can't speak, don't work with every department within the EA as much as I'm really new to this committee, but they... Um, the people I've been working with I think are exceptional and I just want to put that on record. Uh, so, yeah, um, sick leave, uh, pay and grading, non-EA nurseries and St John Vianney. <laughs> Whatever, what do you want? <coughs> Can I just ask you to ask a question again about the youth, youth club piece again? So, so they understand it? Uh, LORAG uh, have written to the EA um, and uh, all the South Belfast elected reps were signatories to it. So um, they were, uh, there is tender for youth service funding um, and uh, th there was a request to extend the deadline from the 12th of April just to give some breathing <coughs> space for the community to be able to respond to that. Okay, so that's a response to a tender then? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> all right. 
Well, look, I, I, five I, I minutes don't, still, so there's a lot to get through there. <laughs> Firstly, in terms of the nursery, I, I don't believe we have any intention not to, not to continue to fund in that space. Okay. In terms of the tender for, for the services on the day of the 12th of April, we, we're going to have to come back on that. I don't have the, the detail on what we're able or are not able to do. In terms of the... Um, I'll, I'll ask Robbie in a second to talk about the business case for the non-teaching um, piece, but in terms of the sick leave, so I think that question was specifically around the statutory assessment team, it was, as yeah. I recall. Okay, so yes, I think I think some of that, I have to be honest and say, I think some of that sick leave is, is, is indicative of the pressure that that team is under. So they are the team that are working directly with parents, and yes, that is, that is very, very challenging. So two things, what I don't want to do is conflate the issue around the what I call the superlink officer okay. there. That's very much about addressing an issue over this summer. Okay. Um, that's about um, working with those parents that maybe find themselves this summer without a place. In the long term, um, we, we know that the number of statements have, have increased <coughs> by about 20%. So we are going to have to find a way to increase the capacity of that team by an equivalent and, amount. And the quality, Dale. There are so many comments <coughs> about copy and paste and inaccuracies within the statements, which I think is okay, quite Okay, right. Okay, well, look, that's, that, that's helpful feedback. We'll, we'll take that away and look at that. So, yes, I think there is a pressure in that team. I think for some individuals, it, it has perhaps played out in terms, in terms of sick leave. But... Um, I don't want you to link it with the with okay. what I, the, the the arrangements for the summer. That's fair enough. Um, and uh, then you were going to um, comment on the pay and grading yeah. review. So, well, look, what I would say is the pay and grading business case took longer than any but any of us wanted uh, in relation to that. But we do have to remember it was a complex <coughs> business case. It's it's for multi millions of pounds. Um, we submitted it in first in February twenty three. Um, there was significant engagement then with the department in relation to it, and you expect that there's economists and so on involved in ba back and forwards. Um, <coughs> that took longer than we had hoped, um, but in November of 23, um, we all got, to, got together with the department. We went through all the, the final issues, and we hoped at that stage um, it, it was finished. So then in December... Um, it was submitted to the Department of Finance. They come back with their queries. That's all part of the process in terms of if any business case. We went back very quickly uh, in, in relation to those, but they, they flagged at that time that GMI and voluntary grammars weren't included um, in, in, in the business case. Now, we wouldn't include them because we weren't the employer and we wouldn't have the information in relation to those staff. Uh, but it was a valid point because it was repercussive um, for those schools in terms of what was being proposed. So the department worked with us at that time and gave us the information that required and we, and we included that in the business case as well. And then the final delay in the business case was caused um, because the business case was prepared at a point in time. So the information that we used originally in the business case was from November 21. And that was the pay remit information that was avail available then. Uh, and 20, at the end of 22, 23 in December, um, we had out, out turn figures for our pay remit, which indicated that the, the numbers and the costs had increased from what they were in 21. And we know what that was for. It was because of SEA and exponential growth and 84% of our salaries, our, our cost in the organisation is salaries. So that, that flagged a uh, flag to us that the business case was in. But because of that change in the numbers and we had now out turn numbers, we needed to address that. So we informed um, the department, I believe, in the 13th of February that we wanted to look at the increase in the SAN figures. We did that. We came back very quickly uh, in relation to that. <coughs> um, at the start of March, we had a tripartite meeting with the unions, DE, and ourselves. We took them through what the issue was that had arisen, <coughs> and we agreed a number of actions as a result of that. Um, we met all of those actions. And we're really pleased that um, the Department of Finance signed off on the, the, the business case last week. <coughs> um, the big issue is that that business case needs funded. We know that there will continue to be disruption in our schools. We know we won't be able to recruit and retain the staff um, that schools need um, if, if that money isn't found and the business case isn't approved. So there's a recruitment and retention issue, but there will be a continuation of industrial action for our young people if we can find the money for that. Yeah, thank you. David. Thanks very much, Chair. <coughs> um, 
I guess first to follow on from some of what uh, my colleague Cheryl had, had raised um, around the schools yet, and you were you were talking about how um, some schools may you know tenth classrooms and so on, and one of them maybe or a couple of them maybe have different uses or spread out more. Um, I just think it's important to comment as we we're saying earlier. I've been to a special school in my constituency where um, cupboards have been turned into storage cupboards have been turned into classrooms, and they are. I was saying earlier, there's full and there's full, and there's full the capacity and bursting at the seams. And I think what is being done, I guess, to review to make sure that you know, one, you're you're proactively working to try and make sure that schools are willing to accept um, SEM pupils in, in in SPIMS and so on, but that those who are Saying no, or uh, or turning, or saying that they're they're full and can't accept that they're it's looked at relatively to some of the others that are maybe that are accepting, and maybe are sort of more bursting at the seams to to ensure that um, there is an understanding of how full some of our schools are because it it does feel <coughs> even the analysis that you're given that some schools have preferential uses for some of their classrooms and maybe optimal, but in the current crisis situation that we, we, we seem to be in with this, <coughs> is it right that you know some schools are able to have that provision, um, while other schools are literally, uh, and, and some, some of the schools dealing with our most vulnerable pupils are literally bursting at the seams. They do not have room for storage because the storage um, is being used for teaching. And what storage they have is often, you know, there's there's issues with uh, leaks getting in and damp and everything else. So I just think those things need to be treated relatively. Um, and I guess related to that, I guess then could we get some idea of what the, the the figures in terms of the school estate more generally, what it is costing to um, maintain the school estate year on year um, for maybe the last couple of years, but then what's maybe forecast going into the future as well. I just pick up on the special schools. I think it's really important. You're absolutely right. <coughs> special schools are bursting at the seams. And um, for those members here who have been meeting with us and have met with us over the last two to three years, whenever we do a political briefings, we've consistently said that we need to build more special schools because we have maxed out on the capacity within the special schools. And that is obviously you know, part, part of the difficulty then in terms of capacity. Um, at the minute, what we're trying to do is be creative around that. We obviously have some plans in place for um, special schools in Belfast for new special schools. Um, but ultimately, all of, those, all of those require investment. And you know, a new special school is probably <coughs> going to be £25 million. We think we could build four special schools in Belfast and fill them, fill them straight away. And uh, there's other provincial <coughs> schools as well, Dungannon. Um, down Patrick, Knock Avon, that need, need special school as well. So there's there's lots of requirement for special schools, and, and we're working that in the in the short term. What we're trying to do around creating additional capacity in special schools, and Donna alluded to it earlier on there. Is so for example, in St George and Belfast, what we're doing is trying to be creative on our. We have a site called the Suffolk site, um, and we've procured some uh, a, a modular special school from the Republic of Ireland that they've been using to help sustain their. Um, uh, rise in special needs children um, and it is our intention to get that on to that site. We've also been uh, able to purchase land in Rathor and Newry so again we will be able to expand special school uh, provision there. Um, we're working in uh, North Belfast area to look at the old Deanby site to see if there's anything we can do there to create special school provision as well so we're working really hard in that area to, to try and do that so um, and in terms then of special schools and additional special schools, yes, that is challenging, and that is where we um, try to set up um, SPYEF, as we call them, which is a much more focused special school type establishment. And we've got had some really successful examples of that, for example, in St Columbans and and, and Kilkeela is an example of that. Um, I'll, I'll pass to Donna yeah, just to talk a little bit about the maintenance. <coughs> So I suppose it's difficult to say how much we need um, or how much. So I can tell you what we've spent. It's not enough. Uh, and, and I know the department, you've had a session around the capital. I'm not going to repeat all of that. You know, we, we need considerable multi 
hundreds of millions. So we estimate um, that our maintenance backlog in terms of all of our schools is about 450 million, but actually we're not even sure how accurate that figure is. So um, we've, we're embarking on a new kind of condition survey program, a five year rolling program, so that we get a much more accurate picture now. Th those are really historical figures and they've been added on year on year. So we're going to target all schools and we're starting with probably the schools that are in the poorest condition and we're going to we're doing a condition survey in terms of what they might need to bring them to where they need to be um, and how much that will cost and that'll be for five and by the end of five years we'll have went round all of our school estate but in terms of what we've spent this year I'll just give you some figures so in terms of and, and I suppose the other thing to say is unfortunately because of the capital situation uh, we only are really able to do response maintenance is mainly so as you all know as your car gets older it's going to cost more to repair and repair and repair so um the majority of our spend last year was in response maintenance. So in terms of our current budget, we spent about 30 million in terms of response ma uh, maintenance. Um, and and plan maintenance, there's about 24 million in terms of capital. Um, I've talked about the backlog. Um, we also did minor works to the value of about 30 million, um, but two thirds of that was, was dedicated to SEN. The majority of it went to saying because that's and we talked about all the additional places and and the needs for refurbs and and modular accommodation um so in terms of how much we need to address the backlog there's a figure of 450 million but we're not sure how accurate that is and we think it's much better that we do this refreshed program over five years and that the highest need is identified and um, and we can discuss with the department the prioritization of that need so uh, just just one more thing. Yeah. Sorry. Um, is the um, I guess to reflect what others have said. I think the communication piece is key, and I understand that um, vacancies and sickness and so on will will add to that. But I think that that idea of not answering the phone, the person who's <coughs> ringing or quite often emailing. Isn't necessarily isn't necessarily seeing that nuance in terms of what's causing it. They just don't see that they're not getting a response. And we've we've had a complaint. Uh, we, we put a complaint in through my office uh, that, that was upheld as, as well. I'm not going into anything that's identifiable around that. Don't worry about that. Um, but that that you know they had their paperwork in for a year thirteen placement. Um, their paperwork in in February. Nothing was done to progress that until June. Um, and despite trying to get in contact with the EA several times through themselves and ourselves um, that wasn't uh, the, the communication wasn't there in a, in a tiny way and my understanding is that the child actually is still not in, in, in placement so I'm, I'm asking yes <coughs> there's someone who their year 13 placement has not been given essentially what happens with someone like that because I would hate to think that it's basically a the clock has run out. You get to, they get to a certain age, and that's not uh, that's no longer education's um, responsibility. That has an ongoing effect in terms of their further and higher education, and ultimately the lives of those people. People the same who already have a number of obstacles in their way in, or, in order to move um, to answer. I think yes, on this yeah, well, you, you get the gist of it anyway. So look, what I would, look, I'm so, <clears throat> first of all sorry that 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 family. You know, find themselves in that position. I'm assuming we're talking about a mainstream people uh, or a special needs people. I think they're. Uh, I think they're seeking uh, mainstream. They're seeking. An, I, I mean, normally. I will, I will, I will I'll bring the details so, to so, you. So, if it's, so, so that, we not deal with a specific case. No, uh, yeah. but I was going to speak generally. I mean, generally, it is up to the schools. So once we do the mainstream piece, which is uh, you know the the yearly cycle mm -hmm. at the you know uh, nursery P1. Uh, P7 going into P8, <coughs> Dixon plan going in from year 12 into year 13. I've got those years wrong, probably. Age and 14. then if you go from uh, yeah, age, uh, 14. age 14 and then age 16, anything outside of that. So, for example, that pupil coming in at a different transition point, they then need to do that directly with the individual school. Okay. But listen, pick that case up directly with us offline and we'll see if we can intervene. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. To the next uh, member, Kathy. Thanks, Chair. Um, I just want to ask something uh, slightly different, a uh, slightly different topic, and that's around the youth funding program um, that was uh, mentioned um, in your brief and the this new program board that's been established. And it's just really to see where, you know, how far this has got or where it is at the minute. Um, and it's just, I suppose, on the back of, 
um, I suppose a lot of long-standing issues that we see in, in youth provision and youth services. And I know in my own area in particular, in the latest round of funding, there was there was nothing there for New York Morning Down at all, um, which I just find mind-boggling when I think of the, the youth clubs and the youth services that are there um, and what they're providing. Um, while we are talking about special educational needs, one in particular, they're having to do their own fundraising. Um, they're asking, they're going and they're asking parents and they're asking local local sports clubs and different things to give them money to be able to put on a specific special educational needs uh, group because um, th- there's 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 nothing else in the area um, for them and it's something that's long standing and it's been running for a long time but I, j- I just I'm just trying to figure out or or is there where, where is the rationale that there didn't seem to be any funding need in, in the Newry Morning Down area. And I know it's not just Newry Morning Down, I know there was other areas that were left out as well, but I suppose it's just to get a feel for that and then this, uh, you know, what changes this new programme board is going gonna, is gonna to make. Well, look, like the, the, the purpose of the programme board is to provide confidence to the system mm-hmm. broadly that, that EA is listening around um, what is required in terms of the provision for youth services. And look, we know that youth services predominantly volunteer based, you know, 80 odd percent of, of, of youth provision is, is provided um, um, on a volunteer basis. But we know that we, EA provides some statutory services. And then obviously there's the community and voluntary sector that provide services as well. So th- the purpose of the programme is to be open and transparent in terms of how we allocate funding um, a- a- across um, the-, the-, the system. Mm-hmm. In terms of your piece about the Newry and Moran Council area, again, and I, I think I believe, Chair, we have a dedicated session in, in a couple of weeks or next week about youth, and we can come back in more detail on that. But my understanding is, and again, well, well, I'll have to pick it up offline, is that each each of the council, so there's a, there's a funding, so we have the allocation, that there's a criteria, and it's the department's criteria where that funding is spread across each of the 11, 11 council areas. And then based on the, 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 the local need, the region and the local need and what the priorities for youth are, that that funding is then allocated appropriately across those each council area. So I suppose I'm surprised that you're saying to me that Newry and Moran haven't had any funding. So I'm I, sorry, Chair, I'm going to have to come back on that particular issue. But I know we're com- we, we, we have a session and we can get into the, the, the detail of that in, uh, at that time. And just in terms of that programme board, you know, where is it or... Uh where, how long are we in a review, or um, when can we expect to find so, it? So, so the, um, the, the work plan, as I understand it, is to um, have a, a, a conclusion by the end of, the, by the end of June, okay. in terms of the funding, um, and to look at what the arrangements might be moving into the future. But it's also linked in, also linked into the department's review of the policy on youth provision as well, and, and there might be an impact of what they, um, what the policy review indicates, might have an impact on the funding. Okay. Right, thanks, sir. Uh, th- thank you um, for that. Um, I just wanted to, to maybe finish with, with one final question. It was a question that I'd asked the department as well. Um, we have focused on, on SEN. We're in a very difficult position at the moment. What 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 can you give us in terms of an assurance that this time next year we won't be back having a, a conversation about a crisis in placements and saying what 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 can be done to ensure that we are in a better place each time? Well, firstly, I think I think we have a good handle on our planning assumptions in terms of. What, what the additionality is going to look like moving forward. I mean, we are focused, obviously, on September 2024, but we are also working around, you know, on September 25 in terms of additional capacity and, and beyond that as well. So one of the key pieces of work we want to take forward is really the pathways for those pupils as these young people enter the system. They're all going to come to a particular transition point, and we need to make sure then that the capacity and that their pathway is plotted out. So there, there is work ongoing on that, Chair, around that. Um, I think we, we internally, EA has stood up a, um, a broader programme of work and diverted additional resource in there. We will continue to prioritise that, um, and I think we, we, we are a better placed. However, I know that, that in the previous session, um, the department officials made the point that we need to do this together. So EA cannot provide absolute assurance that, you know, 
there, there won't be difficulties next year because we really need our schools to work with us to put in place the provisions that are required with what is going to be a very different pupil profile um, moving forward and, and into the future. But we are committed and we're working really closely with the department and colleagues there and we want to continue to work with our schools as well to provide them with, with, with the relevant support. Thank you. I think we'll be saying a lot more of each other over the next few weeks. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like it. <laughs> all right. Thank you all for your time. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Any, any action to rise in, uh, um, Yeah, everyone, just as that's been our first contact with the EA, um, and nobody asked any hard questions of either. <laughs> um, no, I think I don't have any proposed actions for just now. You've got two more briefing sessions in the next in the coming weeks. Any members from Unless that, anyone any, else any has. actions that we want to, to pick up from that session? I think we I'll covered a lot of it with, yeah. the, with, with the department. But Thank you. No, happy to move to next item. Okay. <coughs> okay. um, well, we've covered item seven, which is correspondence earlier, so that just uh, leaves us with uh, the next item of for the forward work program. Um, so there's an updated draft forward work program um, at page 145 of your uh, of your packs. Um, so I would just ask the clerk maybe to speak to the forward work plan first of all, just in terms of where we're at with that, uh, and then we can take it from there. Okay. So, uh, members, we um, the committee <coughs> had planned a lot of, of um, invites and things like that um, before Easter, and a lot of the responses only came in in the last couple of days. Um, so, the tabled forward work plan has got a lot of um, new detail in it. Uh, so, I'll just talk you through what we have. Now, this is in advance of... Um, the strategic planning session that I was, I've was i been trying to marshal <coughs> diary information for. Um, and in relation to that, I'm proposing that the committee uh, do that on the 1st of May in its meeting space, because um, that kind of affords everybody the best opportunity to attend. Um, we mapped where everyone is coming from, um, constituency-wise, and um, we thought near Belfast was actually best. So. There's an outstanding commitment in the legacy report to go to the Forest School, which is at Clandy Boy, just down the road, um, and that is a possibility. So the team intends to go and do a recce next Tuesday, um, and that would allow the committee to take a short briefing from Forest School and then get into its strategic planning session within the, the Wednesday afternoon. Um, so that's that's, uh, that's one. week commencing the 29th of April is it that one or is it the following week um, it is yeah it's the yeah. Okay. 1st of May Wednesday the 1st of May um, and then there's a, there is actually a long weekend after that but the, the holiday isn't the 1st of May itself um, so then um, we've got so we've got EA for the next three weeks um, or today and the next two weeks sorry um, and they're paired with um, policy updates from the department in the first instance and then the operational side of things coming from EA um, and where relevant uh, <coughs> where we can a relevant stakeholder so um, 17th of April <coughs> Unison have um, confirmed that they can come and talk about their um, free school meals uh, campaign and then we would have um, relevant officials from the department and the EA about free school meals and also uniforms um, and transport. Um, then on the 24th of <coughs> April, again the EA um, about youth provision. Um, but I mean, we can we have time if there are other things that come up in these briefings that you would also like um, EA to tell you about. We can let them know in advance. But so uh, provisionally, we're thinking having to have Youth Work Alliance and the uniformed youth groups. Um, as the relevant stakeholders um, for that uh, meeting. Um, you can see the informal meetings as well coming up in the blue column. So we have confirmation of Nick Ictu next Tuesday morning and uh, the British Association for Counselling and Psychotherapy um, the following Tuesday. So then you can see 1st of May, a strategic planning meeting um, at uh, the Forest School. Um, and that would give members an opportunity to consider what they feel their priorities are. You know, are there things that um, the committee should mainline on for the next few months? 
um, maybe things that are kind of short term, medium term, long term um, objectives. Uh, we're, we're getting a lot of um, contacts from stakeholder groups wanting to come up and have an, an informal meeting. Um, if we, you know, if we get too many of those, it may be that the committee wants to arrange a mechanism where you'll have a stakeholder roundtable event or something like that instead um, of the Tuesday morning option. Um, so we'll, we'll do some um, modelling like that. Um, then, and, and also RSE. So our researcher is going to come and present us a paper on RSE at the strategic planning meeting. Um, I've also got a, a bit of an outline today of um, the timings that we might follow um, for the RSE mini inquiry um, and also um, a paper to help us start to consider what uh, the essential aspects of the inquiry will be um, for the committee. Um, okay, so then uh, going into May, uh, it would be uh, we've, we've agreed to have the Integrated Education Fund come in and also receive an oral update on the Integrated Education Act and Action Plan because that's just um, uh, been due within the terms of the Act um, and it would be helpful to have the EA area planning briefing at that time as well because those are quite um, interlinked issues. Sorry, my mouse isn't working very well here. And then the 15th of May... Um, Again, the Human Rights uh, Commission, the Chief Commissioner, can come on that date. Um, and I think the Chair said earlier that uh, an update on restraint and seclusion yeah. policy would be opposite. So I think in that space we could have health and education reps talking about the experience of that in various settings um, and an update from the Department on how that um, guidance is going. Kate? Um, uh, thank you. Uh, just to add, if we could ask officials in relation to childcare um, to come as soon as possible. We were told before Easter that there would be an update on the task and finish group um, and what interim support uh, was going to be made available. I don't think the department have responded to previous requests for a timeline for a childcare strategy, which yes. we have asked. Yeah. Um, and I don't think they were that clear on the task and finish group. So I think we were told there'd be an update after Easter. I'd like to see them soon if possible. Okay, so would you like a written and a, an oral briefing on that? Yeah. Yes, please. Okay. Certainly chase the written bri uh, yeah. briefing, but to have them yeah. uh, here... That's quite poor, they haven't briefing. responded to that. Yeah. Um, that's great. And so the... Can I just add, we were on yeah. restraint and seclusion there. I think yeah. there's, there's plenty of informal slots free. I mean, I think there are lots of stakeholders in that space would want, the, would want to, to, to inform our considerations on that. Mm -hmm. So I think there may be scope if members are in agreement with that to use some of those informal briefings because it crosses health and education and on, on the right space issues. So there, there's a lot there for us to consider. And I really would not want it to be the case that that statutory guidance lands without... The committee haven't had a pr proper consideration in the round of all of the issues. If, if members are in agreement with that, yeah. yeah. Um, do you, could I, yeah, yeah, I was going to say just do I, propose people. The, the, the informal meeting allows you to have people who would otherwise, you know, feel like it was too sensitive to talk about in public because that's obviously not a broadcast meeting. So <coughs> think about who the stakeholders would be for both yeah, formal yeah. and informal. Sorry, Pat. And uh, I suppose I just wanted to say, I mean, the committee has rightly prioritised the whole issue of special educational needs and we've gotten beatings from the department and from the EA and so on. I'm, I'm not sure we're hearing enough from parents who have been affected by this and stakeholder groups. And I'm, I'm sort of taken by... You have any suggestion about a, a, a round table event, maybe? About restraint and seclusion, yeah, in particular. Yeah, but okay. I, I think the committee should be hearing direct experiences from from parents and stakeholder groups. Y yeah, just to back that up, not and not just restraint and um, seclusion. Elma White, um, uh, whose son Caleb um, goes to Harbert and has contacted some members. Um, there was some press in the BBC about him fundraising for the therapy dog. Um, and she's really interested in post-19 um, support. So I think there are lots of other areas that we, you're right, we haven't touched on, and I, I definitely support that. <laughs> and the therapy dog. <laughs> um, yeah, so there are spaces then, really, in May for, for all of that. Um, that that's also an area that, it's, to be honest, uh, Cheryl would know more. It's not an area that I'm overly familiar with, the restraint uh, babies. So I'd be keen if we have a round table, and this is not because of any sort of um, 
viewpoint myself, but to have a spectrum, if there is a spectrum of views on that, to hear uh, hear those discussions sort of openly about what what concerns people have and why, just to have a greater understanding of it myself. Yeah, yeah I, th- I think it's, it's really <coughs> important that the committee is, is properly informed on that issue. Yeah. Um, so the independent review panel um, has given us um, several dates when they're available and uh, part of, I mean it depends on like how much, um, they've obviously done an enormous amount of work, um, it's the most recent kind of research base really on, on a lot of education issues, um, so uh, provisionally um, we could have them there on the 22nd of May. Um, um, with updates from uh, DE on the Emotional Health and Wellbeing Framework and potentially the Addressing Bullying in Schools Act. Um, and then again on the 29th. Now the 29th is the day on which the Economy Committee is proposing the concurrent meeting. Um, so you might want to meet at the Economy Committee's um, uh, time of 10.30 and then come in here at 2 and just quickly do some um correspondence and leave or you might want to have your first you know you might want to speak to the review panel that day um, and then in those next couple of weeks uh, 5th of June um, 12th of June 19th of June they're all um, the, the panel is available so you could take a thematic approach and um, to those and put in childcare put in <coughs> you know whatever I'll, your priorities my, are my my feeling would be is that i think it would be good to hear in, 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 a, in a fair bit of detail from the end of the, from the review panel i think we're very happy very very, very yeah. like specific issue focus which is good but i think this might help us begin to to, to get that overview of, of the system um and, and, and where there's there's maybe a need for reform but in terms of the number of sessions do members have a view on how many we, we would need i mean i would i would be suggesting three as a minimum um possibly mm. four because I think if you try and give them an R on their work, it would be, you know, mm. we wouldn't we wouldn't scratch the surface. But I'm, I'm happy to hear views on that, or that we can take that to our strategic planning uh, session if more appropriate. Yeah. Yeah. Should I yeah. provisionally book them for four mm. sessions? Is that too much? <laughs> like on that on that. I guess, it's, easy, I guess it's easier to book them for that, and if you feel like you've covered enough in the three, you can always, mm. you know, fill that extra slot rather than not cater for it and then be sort of stuck. So I think that makes sense, personally. Or if you want to take a steer from them, uh, you know, through yourself as a committee clerk, how many sessions they feel they need to actually cover their work. You know, we don't we don't want to over, overload yeah. it if, if we know unnecessarily. Mm-hmm. But. Come back to it then. Yeah. Yeah, oh. okay. Um, so we'll say the deprivation issue that you've raised a couple of times, Deputy Chair, about the review panel. Mm. I think that's probably, you can nearly have a whole meeting just sussing out various factors in that with them, you know. Um, Okay, so, yeah, Um, so we go up, I mean, they're in, let me see, recess is the third, no, the last meeting before recess is the 3rd of July, Um, so that's your main um, forward work plan, and then also in the table of papers is the timeline um, on RSE, um, uh, which, do you want to speak to that, Mark? I think you've covered mostly anyway. Okay. Uh, what we're proposing is that the committee would consider the terms of reference and what sort of questions they want to ask at the strategic planning day, make a decision the following week, and then at that weekend we would issue a six-week request for evidence. That would be finished on the 21st of June, and we would prefer prepare some sort of briefing for members for their final meeting before recess on the 3rd of July to allow you to decide who you'd like to take evidence from once you come back following recess. So that's just the timetable we set out there. I, th- I think that looks like a, a good schedule. Um, I, I had sort of initially proposed something being done over the summer, but I think it was rightly pointed out that you know you've got a lot of people on leave, and summertime is probably a, a not the best time to be uh, doing a call for evidence. So the sooner we can get that out, the better. Um, so it'd be if members can just be ready on our strategic planning day with some ideas around the terms of reference, um, that yeah. would be helpful. Um, in terms of the terms of reference, um, the the original impetus for the mini inquiry was the regs that came before the committee in its first or second week. Um, and uh, so there was, on the one hand, um, you know, the requirement to put into law um, 
comprehensive and scientifically accurate education on sexual and reproductive health and rights, covering early pregnancy prevention and access to abortion. Um, and on the other hand, then there was a right um, to uh, have an opt out from that. Um, and that was based on a, on a consultation by the department. So that's kind of where the initial impetus was. But um, it may be that the committee wants to look more broadly at the issue of RSE. So that's what I would like a steer on um, from you. I mean, we can obviously have a comparative approach, um, hear from experts and re read examples from other jurisdictions. Um, there was a sense that the department hadn't consulted with a lot of young people com in comparison to the adult respondents. So the committee might want to go into that youth engagement space um, and consult young people um, on both the the topics um, of sexual and reproductive rights, um, but then perhaps the wider topics of um, consent that uh, Lord Gillen advised should be <coughs> in this part of the curriculum. Um, and so the committee could review the list of topics in the curriculum, seek perspectives from the teaching unions and the inspectorate, um, maybe consider like would a time a weekly time allocation for this kind of education be useful as as there is for uh, PE, um, and then you know who teaches it? Um, is is it provided uniformly? Should it be ta taught by uh, external providers, or you know can teachers opt out? Um, so there are a lot of issues like that that members raised yeah. in the initial discussion. Um, and some of the products then would be an assessment of stakeholder perspectives, um, an analysis of comparative best practice, um, and some of the outcomes and objectives might be recommendations, a report, um, a motion to the Assembly, a debate in the House, um, and potentially legislative changes to the curriculum minimum content order. Um, and even possibly the Address and Bullying in Schools um, Act as well. Um, so that that's, I mean, it could be a substantial substantial yeah, piece of work. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I may be foolishly building a mini inquiry, but uh, <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, my, my uh, strong preference would be that, we, that we, we, we take as broad an approach as possible. I think if we just focus on the issue specifically related to that minimum content order, I think we, we will miss an opportunity, and I think we should be looking at something that really looks at how do we develop an appropriate RSE curriculum for Northern Ireland in its broadest terms. So that's right through from healthy relationships at the early stages through to, to all the is other issues as you move through. Um, that would that would certainly be my my strong preference. Yeah, I I mean I agree. I obviously have very strong views on this, but I'm keen to hear the full spectrum of views as well. So. Um, uh, I thought uh, David was falling off his seat by me saying I'd like to hear other views that don't, don't just align with mine. <laughs> but yeah, have to bring some salt. <laughs> yeah, I think I think I think any discussions around it has to uh, have as um, broad a discussion as possible in terms of, in terms of the views that are reflected uh, um, wherever you go. Um, ultimately, because ultimately you're going to have that with the, the committee and in the chamber anyway, so it's important that we hear um, from. Uh, yeah, as as broad a part of the spectrum as possible. Okay, great. I think that's where we're that's we're well set up for the next the next uh, number of weeks. That's great. <laughs> Unless anyone has anything to add to that. No. Nope. Uh, so that then just takes us to uh, item uh, nine, which is any other business. Um, I'll just reference it briefly. He's not here, but I would would just wanted to put on record my thanks to Danny for attending the youth forum event on the 23rd of March on the committee's behalf, but we can maybe thank him in person when, he, when he's next here. Is there any other business from any other members? No. Okay. Um, so that just brings us to item 10, date, time and place of next meeting, which is Wednesday the 17th of April, uh, and that's 2pm, room 29. Uh, and on the next <coughs> stage, I will just put the question that the committee meeting does now adjourn. Members agreed? Agreed. agreed. Thank you. Thank you. Committee Room 29, Sound. Committee Room 29, Sound.